Yes. Uh, wherever she wants to be, I, I don't care. Are you powerful? Yeah.
know, in support of using your needs to be our community, working with our staff, our administration. Um, so we're here with us. We're here to say that we'll respond the best we can. Uh, Any of the administration, or you might choose to chime in, but you should know AFP. And association school board recommended that not to keep them out of the public meeting that it might just be protected. Uh, but uh, that, that, that's 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 my advice. There may be some that you can put in Um and I'm not even looking at any information and use it to the best of our ability to be consistent uh with my And finally, we don't pay by So, uh, God, if I start to ramble, it means that we don't have to That's very awesome. <laughs> uh, all right. So, again, okay. appreciate being here. Um, topics that we're presenting to us either by presenters or uh, submitted through the presenters. And we're trying to make the best use of our time. We have one of those together. So if you're going to come up and you're going to have to talk on, on the refund, we'll, we'll let that person speak, we'll respond to their questions, uh, and then we'll answer the questions that were pre-submitted uh, on the refund as well. So we're trying to tell us how to, you know, one, one topic thoroughly before we move on to the next topic. Um, get back to this event. Uh, we do not want this communication. Get back to this event. We do not feel like your questions or concerns. We have a lot going to our minds tonight. So this is a this is something I enjoy doing. I I I work doing all the time, but it is something I can walk out of the event and never do that. Did I say that? Thank you, Jack. Nicolette. 
a Christ, Christ person here will present you with your prize. Okay. So, now, we will move to our strategic plan question. Did I cover everything? Were you going to do the video now, or is that later? We're going to do the plan first, okay. and then the video. Yep. So, so, I'm going to present the, the plan, and like I said, it's a glimpse. It's a, it's a glimpse. Uh, this has been a long process, approximately 18 months, maybe a little longer. It was uh, stalled a little bit because of COVID, but we did push on through. And uh, we looked at a lot, of, a lot of data. We heard a lot of feedback from the surveys and, and, and our interaction with, with our community, our parents and students as well, and our staffs. Um, and I really feel good about this plan. The board approved it in February, I believe. You know, they are they are 100 behind it. It is a rigorous, challenging plan. There are some lofty, lofty goals in the plan. We get to dance. Do this thing. Okay. Within the plan, of course, we have our vision statement. Vision statement: many choices, many voices, one result, excellence in everything we do. We want to be excellent. We want to have excellent students leaving us. We want them to have excellent lives. We want to have excellent instruction going on in the classroom, activities, all of that. Uh, our, our goal is, is uh, excellence. And the one more amigo. The students are not your students. They're not Mr. Pat's students. They're, they're our students. We are all in this together, uh, working with, with our students. Uh, Test results at West. Terry Dow needs to celebrate. We're all going to celebrate them, but Terry Dow needs to celebrate them. Terry and those, as they move on up that line, all of these students um, were working together to, to uh, provide a quality education for them. And our mission statement Omega School District, a collaborative community of learners and leaders, ensures that all students learn at their highest levels possible and have the social, emotional, and cognitive skills necessary to live a successful and purpose-filled life. We want our students to be prepared when they walk out the door. You know, we don't necessarily, we want them to be very successful in our classrooms, but if they went through with the C average uh, and they got the courses they needed, and then they were able to pursue a career that uh, they had a passion for, enjoyed, and could uh, uh, live a comfortable life, be a contributing member of society, that post-secondary success is, is what we're shooting for. And that's our goal. Uh, in our strategic plan, we have five goal areas. Academic excellence, social emotional development, employee satisfaction, community, and operations and facilities. All very important. None of those are, are rocket science. It's pretty standard. You'll see them in most every strategic plan. Within each goal area, there is a whole list of action steps, very specific action steps. Some of these are already implemented and taken place. Some still need to be implemented and developed. There's also uh, measures of success. Specifically, we'll be able to look at and analyze and see whether we've accomplished the goal or not, or if we're working towards it and making progress. So, again, we're not going to read through all of this, but I want to focus on some of the key areas. And, and I tried to guess, what, what would be important to you? What do you want to know tonight? And for academic excellence, measures of success, obviously we want 100% of our students to graduate. That's that's uh, might be an impossible goal in a school our size, but that's our goal, and I think we can make it happen. It may not happen every year, but... Uh, Life happens with some kids, uh, parent issues, family issues, whatever, health issues, things are challenging. But our goal is 100% graduation on time. 75% of USD 320 students will uh, achieve post-secondary success within two years of graduation. Mr. Cash can talk about that later, specifically what that means, but essentially is two years out, we want to know that that student's still continue with education, has some type of uh, industry certification, uh, gainfully employed, attending the military, um, those types of things. And assessment scores. We want to do well, exceed 
state and national averages and everything we do, but the two specific ones we're going to monitor uh, are the obvious ones, the Kansas assessments. We want to be above state averages and excel in those and the ACT scores. We want to exceed state averages in all areas, on the composite and, and national averages as well. Social emotional. This is a challenge. It's been a real challenge this year. Uh, it's not just for our students, uh, or for our staff as well, but the, the big focus of this, um, and by the way, for the people at home, sorry for that, uh, for the people at home, I apologize you can see my notes because there's no other way we could make this work. The Zoom people can see, our, see my notes and there's no secrets there, so I'm not too worried about it. But our action steps, our focus in social and emotional starts with relationships. Relationships, relationships, relationships. Um, education for our students and staff, assessments to measure where we're at socially, emotionally, and then supports. When we find out we need supports, we'll have supports built in. Again, a long list of, of uh, action steps and measures of success. Our specific measures of success, there are several, but the two I picked out for tonight, we want 100% of our students to report a positive teacher or staff relationship in any building they're in. Okay, we want our students to feel like they can they can walk into school and they've got friends on our staff. Uh, just the teaching staff, but the, our, our non-teaching staff as well. And uh, our students complete the Kansas Community that Cares survey every year, certain grades do. But on that survey, we want them to report that they feel safe at school. Just simple as that. If you like their values, welcome, have friends, and they feel safe at school. Employee satisfaction. It starts in the classroom. The, the biggest difference in our kids' lives and what they can accomplish, absolutely, uh, the key to that is, is what's going on in the classroom. So we want to recruit, attract, and retain the highest quality educators and mom and non-licensed staff as well because uh, it's, it's critical in all that we do. Again, plenty of action steps and measures of success there. But what uh, everyone can relate to and what our staffs have told us the last two years on our survey is the biggest downside of, of working in USD 320 is, is wage and benefits. So that, that is a goal. That is a, uh, something we want to change. Specifically, we'd like to see our compensation package, total package, be in the top 25% of the state. We'd like our base salary to be number one or at least equal to the highest salary in this area and the North Central Kansas League, the six schools in our league. Um, that I could feel really good about and I hope our staff would as well. So, you know, that's not going to happen this year, probably not going to happen next year, but in this five year plan, we hope to get there. Community, right here, again, relationships, relationships, relationships. We want to build our relationships, maintain them and grow. We want to expand them. If there's someone in the community we don't have a relationship with, we certainly want to, want to reach out to them. So again, action steps, measures of success, but uh, we specifically just want to increase that relationship, relationship and partnerships in as many ways as possible through, through the chamber, our peer chamber group, through through uh, the professionals in our community that can come into our schools and add value and, and talk to and educate our students. Just continue to do those and, and again, grow those things. Operations and facilities. Uh, a significant part of being successful in this area is, is funding budget and being able to have a healthy have a healthy situation in terms of our budget um, in the last five years I feel like we've made some some solid gains in that area and much of it because of, of, of many of you sitting here I know uh, five years ago Adam Toplin uh, Adam, Adam Tyner Adam Tyner and some others of you were, were helping us yes vote to the bond and we passed that bond with uh, nearly 70 percent approval and that allowed us to, to make some uh, necessary improvements in facilities. It allowed us to um, fix some damage to, 
areas of our facilities, make some, again, make some improvements. And that's allowed us to not have to spend so much money in, in facilities and operations these last four or five years. So you know, that's made a difference in our, in our cash carryover, our capital outlay budget. Um, thank you for your taxes, your taxes and, and improving our budget every year with the mill levy in it. Uh, that helps us provide what we need to for our students. So accepting that mill levy and so forth is, is appreciated and an important part of this. And the stability in the state funding program, our state funding aid right now that we receive our state aid. That's, that's been stable for three years. Before then, you know, we were in the courts and, and other school districts were fighting with, with, uh, with Speaka on, on how schools should be funded. Because we know kind of what we're going to get every year and we can plan and we know it's going to be there. It certainly makes our budgeting a little easier. And finally, uh, we've done a relatively good job in this board, uh, helps manage the spending and make sure that we spend our money wisely. But uh, growing our cash carryover and our capital outlay budgets helps us provide the things our students need. And so that's a big part of it. And finally, again, close the one Omega. We're here to uh, achieve excellence by listening to all the voices we can, by offering our students as many choices as possible, and striving for that one result of excellence in all that we do. So that, like I said, is just a, a real quick run through. But I know most of you are here for questions. And that's what I wanted to say also as well. Most of you are here for questions, you have some concerns, and we want to make sure you get adequate time for that. So we are going to jump out of this strategic plan and Jared, I will stop sharing. And we've got a little presentation and a uh, hand for Scott. Scott's been putting these together and we've been working on it uh, together all week. Uh, it's got a little presentation. We have a lot of really good things going on and this video will highlight those. We also are here because we know we have a lot of growth opportunities. But some of what this video uh, highlights is, is the excellence that is occurring in the district. And then we'll focus after this on moving forward and trying to maintain that and, and become even better. So, good? I could do that. And if you guys like it, I made the video. If you did it, somebody else made it. I did not go to school for it, but. Okay. I'm going to step away. Well, Jared is working on that. When do you when do you come up to speak? Um, we'll go through. We'll give you a heads up. We'll do a do a little batting order thing. Who's, who's up? Who's on deck? Who's in the hole? So you can you can prepare or get yourself ready and uh, kind of keep everybody. I have spent my entire life either at the schoolhouse, on the way to the schoolhouse are talking about what happens in the schoolhouse. Both my parents were educators, my maternal grandparents were educators, and for the past 40 years, I've done the same thing. But one of the things that we never discuss or we rarely discuss is the value and importance of human connection, relationships. James Comer, says that no significant learning can occur without a significant relationship. 
George Washington Carver says all learning is understanding relationships. Everyone in this room has been affected by a teacher or an adult. For years, I have watched people teach. I have looked at the best and I've looked at some of the worst. A colleague said to me one time, they don't pay me to like the kids. They pay me to teach a lesson, the kids should learn it. I should teach them, they should learn it, case closed. Well, I said to her, you know, kids don't learn from people they don't like. I have had classes that were so low, so academically deficient that I cried. I wondered, how am I going to take this group in nine months from where they are to where they need to be? And it was difficult. It was, it was awfully hard. How do I raise the self-esteem of a child and his academic achievement at the same time? One year I came up with a bright idea. I told all my students, you were chosen to be in my class because I am the best teacher and you are the best students. They put us all together so we could show everybody else how to do it. One of the students said, really? <laughs> I said, really? We have to show the other classes how to do it. So when we walk down the hall, people will notice us. So you can't make noise, you just have to scrub. And I gave them a saying to say, I am somebody. I was somebody when I came. I'll be a better somebody when I leave. I am powerful and I am strong. I deserve the education that I get here. I have things to do, people to impress, and places to go. And they said, yeah. <laughs> you say it long enough, it starts to be a part of you. I gave a quiz, 20 questions. Student missed 18. I put a plus two on the paper and a big smile on the paper. <laughs> he said, Miss Pearson, is this an F? I said, yeah. <laughs> he said, then why'd you put a smile on the paper? I said, because you're on the road. You got two right, you didn't miss them all. <laughs> I said, and when we review this, won't you do better? He said, yes, ma'am, I can do better. You see, Minus 18 sucks all the life out of me. Plus two said I ain't all bad. <laughs> Four years I watched my mother take the time at recess to review, go on home visits in the afternoon, buy combs and brushes and peanut butter and crackers to put in her desk drawer. He kept those things in her desk and years later after she retired, I watched some of those same kids come through and say to her, you know, Ms. Walker, you made a difference in my life. You made it work for me. You made me feel like I was somebody when I knew at the bottom I wasn't. And I want you to just see what I've become. And when my mama died two years ago at 92, there were so many former students at her funeral. It brought tears to my eyes, not because she was gone, but because she left a legacy of relationships that could never disappear. Can we stand to have more relationships? Absolutely. And we come to work when we don't feel like it. And we listen to policy that doesn't make sense. And we teach anyway. We teach anyway because that's what we do. Teaching and learning should bring joy. How powerful would our world be if we had kids who, who were not afraid to take risks, who were not afraid to think, and who had a champion? Every child deserves a champion, an adult who will never give up on them, who understands the power of connection and insists that they become the best that they can possibly be. Is this job tough? You bet you. Hold on. You bet you. But it is not impossible. We can do this. We're educated. We're born to make a difference.
achieved excellence this year in a year of COVID. Jared, I can use your mic. You probably should. Okay. So again, uh, thanks, Scott. Thanks for everybody that uh, helped make so many of those great things happen. But now, improve, moving to what we can do different and better. Um, so I'm going to actually start a question to answer session with uh, with COVID and masks and all of those things because that I think there is a is a whole page those types of questions. But just so you get a heads up, as I promised, uh, here, here's the uh, lineup. Uh, Aaron McKee, is Aaron here? I haven't seen Aaron. All right, there he is. Hi, Aaron. Aaron McKee, you're going to be up first, okay? So you can be getting ready whenever you feel comfortable. Uh, Kristen, Cotton, you're going to follow Aaron. Um, then we'll follow with uh, two of our great graduates, Logan Ebert and Eli Wolf. Followed by Trey Hartwick, and then Dusty Gallagher, uh, Jacob Simon, Joe DeRushi, Sydney Bollinger, Paul, and Trish, or just Paul, 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 and Bob and Bob and Candy Wheeler, and we'll wrap things up with Kim Honeycutt. So I'll keep reminding you, but uh, let's start with code. We are all done with COVID, I know. But unfortunately, it, it's not quite done with us, but I know uh, we're doing everything we can uh, to make those transitions, but we're also gonna do it in a cautious, cautious way. The one thing we learned, we learned it last spring, we're not gonna make decisions too quick. We can all look back now and probably say that maybe school should have been closed last spring. The way it was, but that's that's pretty easy for. I'm not going to be critical because I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to have been the three people across the country that had to make that decision. But we are not going to make decisions too quick. So in regards to 2021, 20, 22 school year, we will continue to look at the data. We will continue to talk with our health uh, officials. Uh, we'll continue to work with the board and our, our educators and you as parents. We will continue to look at all of that and make a decision this summer. Now, I can confidently say my opinion, maybe I shouldn't, but I can confidently say my opinion if, if uh, I, get a, I get a report from the health department every week. If we have two active cases or less like we've experienced in the county for the last three, four weeks, um, and we have no cases in our, in our schools, uh, and positive test rates are still in that 2%, range like they've been for the last few weeks. I think uh, most people are going to support starting school in a normal fashion as possible. Being optional masks, a normal lunch routine, uh, still taking precautions, but as normal as possible and just continuing to monitor the situation. So try not to worry about it and just realize we're going we're gonna to make a decision, but we're going to make it based on the best data that we have. We have done some things, uh, as you know, uh, we did not eliminate masks, and at this point in time, we're not eliminating masks the entire year, just because of, uh, it's still early, again, making quick decisions. We have a huge couple of events coming up, graduation being one of them. Um, I do not really want to be the person that's responsible for someone not being able to attend graduation, a graduate not being able to attend because they're, they're, they're a positive case. So if there's one little thing I can do for the next three weeks, I think that's worthwhile this year, definitely. Um, and, and these people behind me feel, I know, feel the same way. Uh, we did remove the sneeze guards. We are taking more and more mass breaks. We are uh, letting more people into our schools. If you have an important reason to come into the school as a parent, uh, we're being much more open and, and uh, inclusive of that. I guess I, I want to do this. I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Here are the questions. And please, if you ask a question and you think it's not on here, um, reach out to me at some point in time. Uh, how long will we continue to quarantine kids with minor exposure, exposure to positive cases? That's a policy that changed. We changed that uh, a week and a half ago, I think. Um, the board acted on that. And now, if you're wearing a mask in schools and you come in contact with someone in your class that is a positive 
If you're wearing your mask, you will not be quarantined. You're able to still come to school, attend activities, and so forth, school related. Uh, the health department will still work with you outside of school, but as far as school purposes go, you can attend school and continue to learn. We do not want anyone to miss a significant amount of time in the last 17, 18 days of the school year. Uh, I'm just going to read through all these questions now, and uh, I'll try to see if I've answered them all. Uh, so here we go. Mask. Will, will USD 320 be mandating the use of masks by students for the 21 22 school year? Mask. Can USD 320 sponsor a vote to decide whether mask usage can become a choice for students during the 21 22 school year? With the recommendation from the CDC to continue masks in school as well as the current positive cases at two schools, why is the district considering removing the mask mandate? If, mask man if the mask mandate is removed, what is the procedure for transitioning students from face-to-face -to, -face to remote teaching for the end of the year? Will masks be required for students and staff in the 21-2 school year? We believe the data no longer supports this. Will students still have to wear masks in the fall? Are you going to force students to wear masks again next year? Uh, masks with the decrease in numbers of COVID cases can we move forward with masks being recommended in schools and not required? And then lastly, uh, when will masking cease? Children be allowed to return to the lunchroom at Central, parental involvement on site at school will be allowed, and just a general overview of when school will be completely back to normal and expected routines used before spring break of 2020. So those, those were all the questions submitted. Um, and just a quick recap. For 21-22, we're going to make that decision. I think the data trends, the direction most people support, and there are some that you know want to be very cautious, and I'm going to respect that. But uh, we'll make that decision this summer. Masks will be worn the rest of the school year, but we did make the change to uh, the quarantine of students. Let's see. Oh, this this question. With recommendations from CDC to continue mask in school as well as the current positive case in two schools, why is the district considering removing the mask mandate? Uh, we want to provide the least invasive opportunity for students to learn. We want to have the least amount of barriers for students to learn. And masks are hard to hear through when the teacher is teaching through the mask or the students are talking through the mask. The sneeze guards are, are, are a challenge, as our principal will attest to. And so, you know, again, uh, we, want to, we want to offer the best learning environment possible, but with safety of our students, their, their physical safety, their safety of their health, their social emotional safety, uh, all of those things. But we do want to provide the, the least barriers and challenges to learn and masks and hey, other Tim. things can be a challenge. I'm going to be mean. I'm going to say speed it up just a little bit. We'll okay. sure we get Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, I think I've covered all the answers to the mask question, and that was the biggest topic. Yes. Cool. Okay. So, uh, Aaron, I just showed you what kind of time restraints we have, so. <laughs> <laughs> You're okay. Thank you. And we will, uh, per board policy, uh, you have five minutes. Uh, we'll have a timer and be as polite as we can regarding that five minutes. So, Aaron, it's Absolutely. all yours. So, uh, first of all, I just want to thank all of you for taking the time to bring this together. And I want to thank the parents that have been working together uh, to bring this together. I think this is a great example of one we go the place that I'm so proud to be a part of because we work together so far. And, you know, I just start with that, that we are so blessed to be here. Thank you for, for bringing this together. Um, I thought that was a very inspiring speech, and so I say some of the things, you know, I think we get a plus two, right? Like we got to start positive. I took that out, so we, we're, we're, we've got some great things going on. We're all here together, and we have an opportunity to make some changes. The question that I had, or the question that I really am most interested in, is what we're going to be doing to get better uh, co coordination of classes and opportunities inside and outside of the school, what resources are going to be available to help to make that better and, and uh, 
facilitation of, of those outside academic resources that might help to create some rigor to help our test scores. And I refer to that one of our goals in this is to get in the top 50% of tests and 75% of compensation. And that really feels to me like in this community, we should be in the top, top academic. I don't understand what there would be a barrier if, if, if we were to put the right resources in front of our students. And that may be resources that are, I believe, maybe outside of the academic rigors of the school. And I hear you talking about pathways, and I'm really excited about that. But I've seen with my own kids a lot of challenges with actually getting into classes and actually getting those things coordinated and getting them to help and us to help to understand how we coordinate and, and work together as a school and as a parent group to, to make it actually happen and not look back and say, and I know that, you know, this this last year has been tough with, with Corona, but even leading up to that, I felt like there was maybe maybe some letdown on that coming in and now we're talking about these pathways. So that's my question is, what are the things that we're gonna to do to actually, you know, not just say it, but to do it? Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Key, thank you um, for one. I would say one of the, the first and most foundational things we can do is utilize our plan study, right? And that is going to be where we start to get students to figure out what their interests and their strengths are. And I think that was earlier than normally what we think about. Hey, Kale, would you take your mask off so we can hear you better? Sorry. Can you hear me better? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Some of the things that are, are available to us outside, which is new, MATC has has one up for us. That is an opportunity. Um, our internship program went from zero to three to 28 to 53 kids right now. And every single one of them has a business partner that they need. Um, the person leads, leading through their, their educational um, experience. Um, it's going to take Flexibility of time, I think that's one of the barriers that we usually see when we try to get students out. Um, it's going to take a whole, I don't want to say this, uh, it's a building wide, I think a district wide commitment to invest in that one so that everybody has a part in this. Um, and it is a partnership, it's a partnership with a student and the teacher and the parent and then in the community with this. Um, but if we can get students to make a plan wherever right they get into high school, and obviously it's exploratory, it's going to change, it's going to change, we encourage that. But to know what my ultimate goal or destination is, then we can start taking steps in order to get there. Um, we really have increased our, our uh, uh, dual credit, dual dual credit or current enrollment um, through uh, Community College and MUTC. Uh, options are available. Uh, our community partnership site. That's one of the things I am most proud of as our internship program. Um, but none of that would be possible without having a, a process for that plan of study. Does that make sense? Thank you. Chris is up next. And Logan and Eli on deck. <laughs> Hi, I'm Chris Potter. As I said, you don't know me. I've been here for you. I've been in the community of Omega for nearly 20 years. We have four children. We will have children in the future 24, 15 years. My youngest daughter is great. We feel very passionately about our school. We feel very passionately about our community and the people that start it. Um, I have been an active member of a parent group that formed about two months ago, Trey, part way from the church in this week. We'll give you a little bit more of a background of the who and the why of our parent group. Um, but when we, when we came together, really what we did was we just offered parents an opportunity to share their concerns, share their experiences, and we just listened and kind of collected common themes. And uh, one of the themes was rigor, uh, the lack of rigor at our high school. And that's what I'm going to be discussing tonight. 
Um, I'd like to start by reading a letter from a mother. Mother wanted to remain anonymous. She wanted her child to remain anonymous, so I'm representing her. Um, she shared the story with me. She had tears in her eyes. were reviewed. We were completely shocked and quite upset at the results. Our son, a recent Omega High School graduate, was an AB student all through high school. He started taking the ACT as a sophomore, took it three times, but could not get it above an 18 in the score. We as his parents were very confused and disappointed. How can an AB student not score above an 18 on the ACT? We pushed him hard, very hard, to get better. We purchased a review course for him. He worked and studied and tried to improve his score. Our assumption the entire time was that it was all him and he needed to work harder, more, and to improve his score, but it didn't work. Now, after seeing recent ACT scores, it seems that the problem is much bigger than just our son. In order to go to Kansas State University, you need 21 on the ACT. The average scores, um, the average scores shown in the meeting were 20 and below. So. The average student at Wilmington High School did not get a high enough score on the ACT to attend Kansas State. He said to us in so many ways, but one of the biggest reasons is the pressure we put on our son to do better. Now we see that it's likely not, that it's likely that he may not have learned what he needed in school in order to get an acceptable ACT score. Based on our son's grades, all 13 years in Wilmington schools, we never thought this would be an issue. He has always been a good student, but here we are, and now his college options are very limited. He's out of high school with no direction as to what he wants to do with his life. We as parents feel like we have failed our son by not speaking him sooner. We thought the issue was with him and didn't realize until watching recent school board meetings that it is more widespread. We should have spoke up, asked more questions, gone into the school, talked to the teachers and administrators, but instead, we just put pressure on him to do better and assume everything else was fine. Well, now we are speaking up. It's time to do better for our kids. Change is needed. It needs to come quickly. We still have other children in school. There are several things that have been apparent to us. The new math curriculum needs to be put into place immediately. We have struggled with math for years with our children. We have been frustrated to the point of tears because we can't understand it. To hear in the school board meeting that the math curriculum is bad, but we don't know when we will get a new one in place, it's frustrating. It needs to be a top priority or kids deserve it. Block scheduling is also an issue. The classes are very long. The kids lose focus. They also seem to have quite a lot of free time in their classes to play on their phones. If class periods were shorter, it would be easier for them to keep their focus, less time to waste, and ideally more learning would take place. Class retakes need more structure. We are not just retakes. <coughs> it creates, creates a culture of procrastination if they are allowed to do it over and over again. There is not any specific rules regarding retakes. As we continue to listen to parents, junior parents, came out in full force, sharing that their students are scoring a 15 and a 16 on the ACT this year. Students have too much free time in their day. Students are asked to be called out of school because they're bored. Students don't know what the plan is for the classes. They can go weeks with no exam. All of a sudden, and all of a sudden two exams multiple times can be turned into a few times. I'm so sorry. The rule is five and ten. Okay. Thank you. I'll send the rest of you to
and um, the teachers have spent quite a bit of time and the principals evaluating what the curriculum should look like and making sure that it fits um, with the science of reading and what we should be teaching with our standards. Um, but the other piece of that is we are also going to expect, and, and we've talked about this with the teachers explicitly, we've got to follow this curriculum. For this next year, as we implement it, we've got to do it the way it's designed because experts have put the curriculum together. And so as teachers, we're going to have to trust that that is built in and it's set up uh, the right way. Um, and we're going to have to follow it. And then we'll have to, then we can evaluate it the second year and start saying, okay, when we went through it the first time, these are the holes that we saw. Um, these are kind of some gaps where we're seeing between, you know, seventh grade and eighth grade. So how are we going to, how are we going to um, fill in those gaps in the curriculum? But for this next year, our expectation of all teachers, K-12, will be that you implement the ELA curriculum the way it's designed to be to, to be done. And so we talked with the teachers. You know, um, sometimes teachers have a favorite poetry unit that they want to do or a favorite novel study. Um, this next year, it's not going to happen. It's we're going to do it the way it's designed. And so we're going to put those other things that we kind of like to do or we think is important. Um, on the on the sidelines until we went through it for a year, and then we can go back and, like I said, evaluate it and see what we need to, to do to make it better and better. So the math curriculum is, um, we're already talking about it. We have another meeting with the 612 math teachers, um, I think May 10th or May 14th, um, to really start looking at it. If we can get it done, um, we want to pilot a new uh, math curriculum 612 uh, starting in the fall of this next year and at the last meeting that we talked about um, one of the one of the questions was if, if we like it are we going to stop it you know if we pilot it through December we're going to stop it and then go back to our old one and you know then implement it the next year so it doesn't really make sense to do that so hopefully if we can like work magic get everything done uh, we would just be able to continue as long as we find the one that's going to work best for, for our schools and just keep using it for the rest of the year if we can get it to work. You know, my head that'll work makes sense, but logistically, I hope it can make sense too. So, those are a couple of ways that we're going to address at least the ELA curriculum and the math curriculum. K, uh, K, K5 math, we will start evaluating that for this next year with hopefully a you know, pilot following year after that so and there is a review cycle that we have at least for the curriculum that we'll start using it it'll kind of come up every sixth year yeah um i got, I got three things act block schedule and three takes are great right Okay, I don't know if I really teach with that during class. The students in locker rooms have been in challenge all year, and if we could get our coaches to lock that locker room, that would take care of the issue. That has been a struggle. I'm going to get that. Are you grounding on the classroom? Say that again. Are you grounding on the Am I grounding on the classroom? We do, we do what we can. Yes, sometimes it's better than others. Yes. Um, as far as block scheduling and downtime, um, 95 minutes, and I think everybody in here, if you have a high school student or a one, would agree that that is a very, very long time for some classes. Okay, when we talk to our high school staff about this, they would agree with that. For most of our classes, 95 minutes is, is, is too long. Our students would say the same. For most of our classes, it's too long. But it's not for all of them. Some of our CTE classes, some of our AP classes, it is an appropriate amount of time. Our welding classes, when we ask our teachers and ask our students, they want more than 95 minutes. They don't think 95 minutes is enough. The current system that we're in, and this is the cookie cutter approach to education, this is our schedule that we chose. I don't know how long we've had block scheduling. Nine years? More than that? Too long. A very long time. Um, and I know there was research done to, to go into the block scheduling. And I know people who are in a traditional schedule right now say, hey, we're really looking going at block scheduling because we don't like what we're doing. There is no magic answer to a perfect schedule. If there was, every school in the country would have it. The downtime, 
as frustrating as it is for me and you and that anonymous parent, some of that is inevitable. Because our students learn at different speeds. They learn at different paces. And there will be students who get done like that. And there are students who need some time to work in there. And the students that don't, I'm sorry to say, much of that time is it's dork around time, right? Um, Now, yes. Can we let um, Logan talk and then maybe, because I think you're talking about Grim Trigger too, right? Logan? Uh, yes. So then maybe that'll give you a minute to kind of think about it. Sure. If, if that's okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Mr. Glad. Thanks so much for granting Eli and I the opportunity to speak in front of all of you today. My name is Logan Hebert. I graduated from Omega in the top 10% of my class, and I'm currently a medical biochem major at his state. I've held the roles of scholarship and recruitment chair of my fraternity, and I'm now serving as the director of judicial affairs for the Inter fraternity council. I come to speak today and represent the Wamigo alums and their thoughts and ways to improve the school system. I've talked to about 15 to 20 alums, and they most notably talked about retake policy. Um, it's not like college. In college, you can't retake tests. Uh, this leads to a false sense of confidence um, due to inflated grades, and Mrs. Cobb touched on this. Um, you feel like you should be doing better in class, and especially when you get to college, it's sort of becoming a god moment. Uh, personally, I got a 292 my first semester. I was a straight A student coming out of Old Migo, uh, you know, and I didn't have the study habits. And there was a lot of kids from Old Migo, especially in my class, who didn't have the study habits. Um, most of them straight A's uh, because they could get away with studying one to two hours on the weekend for almost all their classes, um, especially rigor wise, and get A's. Uh, whereas now, like, I'm putting 20 plus hours or more for individual tests in college. Um, so this, uh, with my experience as a scholarship chair, I've talked about high school experiences with multitude of other kids and their high school experiences. Uh, most of the kids uh, that come from larger schools have already understood, like, the basics behind Calc 1, and some of them are already into Calc 2, and this is just from their high school experiences. They have higher math and science levels, uh, Chem 1 and Chem 2 at K-State, so the kids in my fraternity were already developed in those skills. Um, so I went and looked up and did some research, and based off the 2019 census, which was the last year we, before we had COVID in the year I was in high school, while we were ranked 94th out of 325 schools in Kansas, it's the top one third. Um, however, right down the road, Rock Creek ranked 10th out of 325, which is the top 5%. I've talked to a few kids. Zane Roberts is one of them. He's the president of Delta Sig. A uh, great cross country runner. He moved here from LA to the East, was originally going to come to Amigo and ended up going to Rock Creek just because his parents wanted him to move to that school system. Um, one of the things I did want to point out I think Amigo does a great job of special education. Uh, I have never heard anywhere the type of programming that we have here for that, and I'm very proud that we have that. Um, I love all the teachers of Amigo. Uh, I just think the system in which they teach can be improved, and I think that's why we're all here. Pass it to Eli, and we have uh, questions after him. All right, so uh, I'm Eli Wolf. Um, I graduated with Logan in 2019. Um, but I was the valedictorian of that class, um, and I'm also a medical biochemistry major with Logan. Um, I'm pre-med, and he's pre-dental. Um, in terms of high school, I was involved in cross country and basketball for four years, and then I also did NHS, Peer Chamber. Um, I was a Kansas State Scholar and then an AP Scholar as well, I think. So I have some experience with the academic stuff. Um, so first, I was going to talk about, I guess, actually the block scheduling comes up to. Um, I have a couple love-hate things with this. Um, a pro is that it's, it's more relaxed, and I guess I say it's simpler. I'm not saying that it's easier, but that it's easier to focus on each class when it comes up each day, um, rather than having all seven or eight of your classes back to back to back. And then, you know, if you're doing a sport too, you get home at nine, if you have homework with two or three of those classes, then you're doing the homework. Then you can, you, you can kind of choose a day to do homework if you have any of it. Um, a big con of this is I think three of the four years that I was in high school, we had snow days happen, 
and we would be probably three or four either red days or white days behind um, just the way the snow days laid um, and there really wasn't any way to catch up other than our great teachers again um, kind of just being able to transition seamlessly cut some things out for us because there wasn't much else to do um, and then another thing I was going to talk about is I do think that there are a lot of tools for success at at least the high school already. Um, and I think people don't always think like it comes down to how much your own kid wants to do, I guess, sometimes. Um, because I know a lot of very, I think we had a pretty smart class, in my opinion. Um, I knew a lot of smart kids that took less hard classes junior and senior year. And that's fine because, you know, everyone wants an easy senior year and everything. But, um, I wasn't gonna listen to them, I guess, or feel for them about having less credits going into college or having a lower GPA or not getting the scholarship they wanted, particularly because they could have all done. The tools were there, I guess, is what I wanted to say in some facet. Um, and then third, I guess, is just a thought that I always have, um, and I it may have been a good reason for this, but. We used to, when I was in sixth grade, a long time ago, I guess I'm so old now, um, we, we used to have a, a, new, a different math program. Um, basically, it let you go into, you had to test into it going into sixth grade, um, and then you could choose whether you wanted to do it or not. Um, I chose to do it. There were about eight or nine of us, and it allowed you to, to go into high school two years ahead of in math rather than one. Um, they did away with this, I think, when I was like, like, this was three or four years ago. I'm not sure yeah. if there was a good reason for that. We still have it. You still have it? Yeah. The two years ago. And every year have more students than ever. Okay. Well, I like it. It's good. <laughs> um, also, the advanced um, science. Unfortunately, you don't have to be good, but. Okay. Can we talk yeah. to yeah. the board about votes to allow people to finish speeches? I understand we're trying to get this through. But we're here to do Q and A to listen and to understand what's going on. I guess I have one quick last. Yeah, you know what? And you can just ask your question. You have questions, right? Yeah. Yeah. Here, I'll I'll just say the thing about these advanced like middle school classes. I like it because offering all these advanced classes in high school, like APs or advanced um, biology, advanced chemistry, it doesn't always matter because they're going to have to get through the regular curriculum first. So being able to accelerate them in middle school, I like. So it's a good thing. Um, I guess we can ask the questions. Uh, this is specifically for STEM. Any kid coming from Columbia who wants to go any major with engineering or pre-doctorate, how do you plan to incorporate higher level math and science courses into the curriculum at Columbia High, besides the ones that are already there? So you're, you're asking how do we incorporate like on a tier one level, every single classroom is higher level math what concepts? Yeah, so concepts like, um, I know we have stats and calc, uh, and then college algebra is something that we can be taking concurrently. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know just being smaller, sometimes AP Bio and Advanced Chemistry can't be taken. Those were two classes that were extremely helpful going into college. Yep. And if they're ones that could always be offered, yep. basically, yeah. That's very good. I agree with that. Um, MATC has, they're going to offer more and more every, every single year as they sort of develop here. Um, they pretty much ask, what do you want us to teach if we're going to make it happen? Um, what are our teachers certified in? What are our students not getting that they're asking? We're, we're going to make that happen. MATC and I are very, very grateful for that. Um, we do have a STEM class now. That's a new one that we've, that we've added that used to be more physical science that's STEM. Um, and I will say too, as, as we start to look at how we teach kids a little bit differently, right? It's not going to be so in, in boxes, right? I've got my advanced math over here. I've got my AP line over here. It's going to be more uh, full cross curricular activities. Okay, assessed by these larger problems or competencies that our students are trying to solve. 
um, and, and to show mastery of it. Um, that's easier to do when you look at it in that sense, but it's going to take lots of collaboration. It's going to take lots of uh, knowledge, I guess, of the scope and sequence. What are these teachers doing here in this content throughout the semester? So we need to take advantage of that. Not just in an advanced math classroom, but on a whole tier one, school wide or department wide, or student specific level. Gotcha. That makes sense? Yeah. All right. So, thank you so much for allowing us to speak here. Thank you guys. Hi, I'm Trey Hartwick. I have three current high school students, and my stepdaughter is in fourth grade, Wes. Um, I'd like to discuss and explain the history behind creating a parent and community group that we had formed, and then just highlight the ideas and themes that we saw that did tend to align with the redesign um, process and some that didn't. So I'm basically going to read through my notes just so I can have you stay within the five minutes and answer to get my question. Many parents were hearing feedback and information about the redesign efforts from our students with concerns of what the focus was on. We felt that there was a disproportionate weight of focus on the students and what the students were expressing that they wanted versus what parents were addressing they felt their student needed. There were minimal opportunities initially outside of a few emails and watching board meetings to learn about the details of the redesign process. We do recognize there was a community meeting held on December 1st where roughly 30 individuals were invited and I believe roughly 10 attended. That was then utilized when they presented to the board as um, information that they had collected from the community to collaborate with students and teachers to come up with the focus of the redesign. We felt that was a, a, a low number to represent our, our true community of parent concerns. Therefore, we decided to hold our own community meetings and collect thoughts, concerns, potential solutions with nearly 60 families. The group felt that our collective concerns and questions were better conveyed as a group to administration and the board, so we submitted questions and requested for parent involvement opportunities. We greatly appreciate that those requests were answered with the Zoom the meeting before spring break and this forum opportunity. Overall, our goal is to provide input, potential solutions, and support correcting weaknesses that we have in high school. We hope the perception of this group forming is not negative, but that we're interested in having your efforts. We are grateful for the redesign process, and we're, we're glad that there's a thoughtful look at these issues and that we know you're working towards strengthening our high school. Our desire, however, is to be a productive partner and stakeholder in the process. So with that said, I want to go over some of the areas that we feel like we do and don't align with some of the focus that you have done in on. Structure of the school day. Obviously, we're hearing that over and over today. Um, by far, the top issue discussed in the three meetings that we held with parents was block scheduling. We understand the theory, the, benefit, the theory behind the benefits of block scheduling. However, we feel that it hasn't proven in practice here in Long Beach to be beneficial. There's too much unutilized time during the day. Also, understand the historic reluctancy of high school teachers to not want to move away from block scheduling is a concern. We encourage a strong look at moving away from block scheduling, and that's a good amongst most of our group. Also, the idea of pilot, piloting when Fridays was split around after spring break, which didn't come to fruition, and we're grateful for that. But that was met with a lot of reluctancy. There's not an appetite for a four day instructional week with a potential flex day Friday um, amongst this group. The majority of families support a traditional school day to allow students to see their teachers every day. As you can see in the parent perception survey, that was one of the areas in high school scored highest. Our students appreciate their interaction with their teachers, and that was echoed also in your video that we've opened with today. We feel it builds stronger relationships when a student can see a teacher every day. We feel students will stay more engaged, and we also feel that repetition promotes learning. Additional pathways and individual plans of study. These are areas we do align quite a bit with your thoughts and what you share. Families support additional pathways, but not at the expense of core curriculum. We do feel like the the truest way to provide students the opportunity to pursue their passions and long-term pursuits is by having a strong core. Plans and study are key. This gives a roadmap to show how students complete high school requirements early and can begin to explore their additional pathway, pathways as juniors and seniors, and as you indicated, using some of our local resources. We're fortunate to have an ATC here. We're fortunate that we can jump over to Highland. We have K-State and Washburn Tech to utilize. 
You just need a schedule that can support that as well. And then there's a lot of discussion about the culture that at the high school of procrastination. We do feel that there are a few things that could change that hinder or, or build upon the culture of procrastination. The retake policy, you've heard it already today. And we'll have that also addressed later. We feel there needs to, uh, retakes are supported. There just needs to be provisions to it and rules of way of use. Inefficient use of block scheduling time is also, again, a part of that. You know, there's the, I can get to it later, and the tablet is built on our students, and we do feel a time schedule decreases that human tendency to procrastinate. In, closing, in closing, parents support a bold, swift change to improve the weaknesses at our high school. We do want to have a serious look at changing away from block scheduling. We'd like to increase the focus of, in our core curriculum, and we'd like adjustments made to that retake policy. We know that there's been a new map for him um, pinpointed and we, that's already been addressed. We do support that changing immediately and hope that we can get that done in August versus January 2022. We also support swiftful changes in the school structure and the scheduling. So I have two questions. Would there be an opportunity for a parent site committee to be added to the redesign plan to participate along with the redesign team? And are you willing to make changes or pilot a new schedule or structure for the high school in August? Um, Trey, thank you, and I will to say that nearly everything that you said, um, I agree with, and I know the entire high school staff agrees with too. Um, piloting Blood Fridays after the spring break was never we were going to do. Okay, it's just something our students were coming home with, and I think the lack of the communication plan at that time was was a struggle for that. That I think that was that, that was some wishful thinking too. That was one of the, the strongest desires of the students. We weren't going to do that, um, and I think I, I think I emailed you early. Um, this was even last uh, semester during our remote, not remote, um, hybrid time. Um, we weren't really looking to move forward or even pilot or consider a, a win Friday day. Um, but the concepts of that, that flexibility of time um, is what we want to take with us on that. And if you talk to uh, some of your sons or daughters about how well the advisory time works, uh, that's where I think we see the most waste of time throughout the day. Um, I will be the first one to say that. That, that, needs, that needs some restructuring. Um, your first question, though, was about the adding a parent group. Yes, um, that's something that we've we've looked at, we've talked about, we've talked about, we've talked about, we've talked about with the state and with other schools. What is the best way to engage our outside stakeholders from the community, from the parent side? Um, what I think we would like to do, we meet nearly every single Wednesday for specifically redesign and with our gate and investigative teams. Um, at some point here in the near future, or it will be in the fall when things hopefully do open back up entirely, um, we would love for parents to be a part of that. You know, we, it's, a, it's a set schedule. Um, there is something to be said about getting a larger group of community and, and parents together. Um, we did invite 40 people. We went through painstaking efforts to figure out how can we get this diverse group of, of people, individuals, professionals around the community um, to talk about this. Is that again? What was that process? What was the process? Yeah. We, we as a, as a gay team, we just, we pick people. That was the process. We pick 20 on the parent side, we pick 20 on the community or business leader side. Well, are you guys open to allowing, you know, a, a group of parents to be a particular site committee to move along with the remaining of the redesign? I think that we can serve as a liaison to the community for you um, in building support because it takes all of us to get these lofty goals accomplished. Right. So we want to be a part of it. I know that, and I, and I do appreciate that, and we all do. The, the answer to that is yes. I don't know what that's going to look like right now. I know that we were very, very limited uh, when we were in December 2nd sure. with how many and what that would look like. Winter and I have talked about this too. We do want to get more parents involved in this. And I know that is a 
strong uh, desire, and it's a need for both of us. Um, I'll say right now, I think it's going to be yes to that question. And then what is the willingness to change or pilot any schedule in August? Um, <clears throat> the answer I got today from our captain on our time goal investigative team was we're still a little bit of ways from having consensus on what we want that to look like. Um, I will tell you, though, with that being said, the redesign process, it, it doesn't it doesn't strive for getting it right the first time, right? right? You plan for change, not for perfection. Um, I did even ask, would some of this team be willing to come over the summer and see if, if that would be appropriate, if we could start that. I think that might be easier for the students and honestly for the staff if we could get them into that in August. Um, this process though, doesn't, it's very contradictory to top down, right? described as top down, bottom up, and inside the slide. And these teacher groups, these professionals that have been putting the time into research this are the ones that we're going to have to make that make that decision. Is it out of the question? No. Um, I don't know what the answer is yet though if that's going to happen. Yeah, I just it was um, explained in other board meetings that the center made three changes within a semester of their schedule. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's, it's hard for me to believe that we don't have the same capabilities. It's, I think, the willingness. Yeah, you know, that's that's, that's very good. Um, and I will say that that is a mind shift from I'm comfortable doing this to this is entirely new. It's going to be scary. One of the reasons, or one of the things that you said was um, it's concerning that maybe teachers are um, hesitant maybe to, to relive something. Mm -hmm. And I would say that's human nature. You know, yeah, this, like, this is what we are Okay. Right. I, I'd like to speak in here. Um, we have been if the looking over this thing. process. So so that, if that is that to the board. The board's been monitoring this process for a redesign. Corey and I have been to places. Claudia's been to places. It's, it's not obvious. Okay, sorry. Okay. I just thought I'd tell you that we're asking for you to use the mic. And I, so don't don't think that the high school and the teachers are doing this unbeknownst to the board because it's not that way. Yeah. With regards to the, the scheduling, here's what I see as the biggest problem. We do have our AP teachers, if we go back to 50 block minutes, are going to go crazy because they have so much content. Chemistry, I can't imagine. Band will be hard. And so we're trying, I think it's so complicated how we want to, to do the schedule because some should be 50 minutes, some need to be 90 minutes, and they're really taking a full look at all of that. Yeah, I know that they've also looked at some type of hybrid where maybe right. we can accommodate for those other curriculums at 90 minutes and the ones that are, are core, like math, where you need that repetition. And, can be and going to MATC and going to Highland. And so we're trying, I mean, I. So I do hope that we'd have something by August because it'd be nice for the scheduling. Mm -hmm. um, but the board has to also approve that. And so it's not going to happen under the dark. They don't have to approve it to pilot, was my understanding, however. Yes, it will, it will be piloted. The other thing I do appreciate, though, is to get a group of family, you know, and probably not a large group of uh, parents, but a select group of parents mm -hmm. to come in. And we know our communication is deficient. Yeah, we recognize your efforts to move in a better direction. But that. yes, and we do want to move in a better direction. So I guess, and I don't want to say anymore because we are running way late. Okay, I appreciate um, Anyway, I just, so you know that, I mean, that is a concern to everybody, is how is that really going to look that really gets those individualized plans to study teachers? Sure. So it's not that good. But so. I also think it was stated earlier, you know, it's not going to look perfect when we implement that math curriculum in the first go. But we have a five-year trend of declining test scores or ACT and standardized tests. We can't take five years to dig out of it and have a decade of substandard education here long ago. Our teachers don't want to teach at a school that's known for that. Our students want to, don't want to come from a school that's known for that. So it's going to take a willingness. I just want you to know you have a partnership in your community willing to push for bold swift changes. Thank you. I do have one quick question. Mr. Captain, Ms. Lord, you mentioned that you are totally fine with having a parent. What's 
what's the holdup? If it's because we can't meet together, can we just not Zoom on those Wednesdays? What is really holding that group from being a part of the meetings? Um, I, I will say one thing right now is the end of the year whirlwind that we're in. Um, our redesign time at the end of the year is going to be limited. We've got it all when we've got end of the year, so that's that's one thing. Um, if I don't care if we open that up, I think that would be wonderful if we do meet and we'll probably meet more times as a redesign gate team. I'll be more happy to send that out. And at least see, see what it looks like for now. It'll be Scott, you said it more. It's it's a uh, it's very good. It's very good. Planning. Thank you. Well, I just was curious. I mean, if you want the input, there's a lot of people that are willing to help. It doesn't have to be the entire group, but it could be. They could select the select group that would be the voice of the community and to you guys. I think that would be a good start to get to collaborate together. All right, Jessica, are you ready? I'm ready. I'm going to set the time on my watch. Oh, so okay. you can stay on, on task. Okay. Okay. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Dusty Gallagher. Um, I'm very happy to be here tonight and, and provide some thoughts. Um, I have a child at the high school and at the middle school, so we'll be involved in the school system for a number of years. Um, again, thank you for hosting this forum and providing the opportunity to speak. Tonight, my comments are going to be about the school redesign. And I really appreciate the efforts that have gone into the process thus far and agree with the underlying basis of the project, which is to improve the teaching and learning in our school. However, I do have some concerns. Notably, the lack of care and community involvement, which has already been discussed, but also with transparency of impl implementation of what is proposed. And to illustrate these concerns tonight, I'm going to focus my comments on a similar project our district undertook nearly a decade ago and a specific policy that came from that effort, the testing retake policy. So as I understand it, the retake policy was developed with good intentions, the same intentions that underpin this school redesign project, but the results were not as expected. So in, in preparing for this discussion today, I spent a lot of time researching this issue and talking with parents of past, present, and future high school students. A few themes quickly emerged from these discussions. The first theme, implementation of this policy has lacked uniformity and consistency across subjects and teachers. This directly relates to implementation. Whether change in administration, teachers, or simply as time passes, the emphasis seems to have become more to get kids good GPAs than learning the material. This has led to a culture of unpreparedness and procrastination in our students. Complacency and false expectations have no place in our school system. The consequences associated with this may have been lessened or removed in schoolwork. However, they have certainly not been, been lessened or removed in the real world, and this is a huge problem. Theme number two, our students simply aren't learning the material primarily because there is less of an incentive to learn it because there's no rigor in the first test or even the second test when they take it. The remediation process can be long, the exact same test given as the original test, and it becomes far too easy for students to obtain questions and answers from classmates. Theme three, all of this is contributing to the fact that our current GPAs throughout all grades are high Yet our assessments and test scores continue on a downward trend. We've already talked about that tonight. But my question to you, is this acceptable? Is this achieving excellence as we outlined in our strategic plan tonight? So this brings me to a number of questions. And I'm sorry, but I have five. I'm going to go through them very quickly, but I do have a handout for you, a cheat sheet, if you would like. So question number one. Who is in charge and responsible for proper implementation of the testing retake policy? And who will be in charge of any new policies that emerge from the school redesign? Number two, will a plan be developed so that future administrations, excuse me, administrators and teachers can follow and maintain the integrity and the purpose of any new policies? 
Question three, will there be sincere effort and commitment from the administration and teachers that rigor in in and intent of these policies are met? Number four, what data or evidence needs to be collected and shared collectively to help our district evaluate if these policies and impl implementation methods are effective? And finally, how can we improve our checks and balances to determine how well we are accomplishing our one and only goal in this district, which is to educate our students? So in conclusion, we need swift and bold change. We need to develop policies based on good intentions, sound, measurable objectives. We need policies that will be effective and implemented right now, and ones that will last for the long term so that our children and the next generation of children can rely on our school system to prepare them for the real world. So thank you again for the time granted to me this evening, and I look forward to your uh, responses to the questions. Yeah, I'm going to need a cheat sheet. <laughs> um, number one, who is in charge and responsible for proper implementation of the testing, retake policy, and any new policies that emerge from school redesign? Um, I don't know who said this earlier, but the way that policy is currently written, and I think I've heard that that's changed quite a few times since its inception. Um, there is some autonomy with what that looks like from department to department. And I know sometimes that might be a good thing for different departments with different needs, but I know as a whole that can be very challenging for a student because I have expectations for me. So there's yeah, seven different teachers. Um, who's in charge of that? Usually the retake policy is a department decision. That's a department decision of the teachers. Um, any new policies that emerge from school redesign, and I know you talked about um, administrator or even teacher turnover. Um, the way this process is, the, 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 the teachers are the leaders on here. We've got our, our pilot and our co-pilot, we've got our captains. Every single one of those leaders are our teachers. Um, if we decide this is what we're going to do after our pilot stage, uh, get into our launch and an adoption phase, um, that's going to be my job to make sure that we are doing this with commitment or fidelity, if you will, um, because it's going to take that commitment. Knowing that there will be probably pockets of things that we're going to be looking at too, and not every part of redesign has to be a whole school Does that answer your first question? I guess I would like to make the further point, however, if the teacher is in charge, but I think there has to be some level of accountability. And I guess I, I don't necessarily mind that there may be slight differences between departments, but there has to be some level to ensure a measurement of making sure that it's working. I mean, I think we do not, I, I don't think it's working. So that really, that's kind of the theme of my question is we need some accountability on all of these issues. And that's what we're not seeing right now. <clears throat> yes, I, I, I get that. Um, I don't know the answer to that right now. What is that going to look like? How do we get um, to the answer? That's, let, that's what I think we have to come away here tonight, is how, what is the process to find that answer so that we can start making these positive changes to meet that strategic plan? Nobody's going to disagree with your strategic plan. But the devil's in the details. What are those things that are, and how, what is that process that it's, that's gonna allow us to make steps toward achieving those goals? Um, what, whatever goal area is, is on the competency-based grade or competency-based learning. If we can implement that well and with fidelity, if we can develop what soft skills that we want our students to graduate with, I honestly think much of this is going to take care of itself. When you say soft skills, what I mean, what about the hard skills? What about the core competency things that, that they have to have that we've heard former students say that they missed out on? What about the hard skills too? Let's not leave that out. And, and I'm not, 
those that's what I'm talking about. Our, our core, our core competencies, right? But we also, because I know part of the not part, much of the frustration I think with the retake policy currently is that we're enabling students to procrastinate. We're not teaching them what life is really like. Um, it's it's creating a um, students just just don't do anything and then and then rely on well I, I can do it anytime I want. There's no consequences for it, right? Those are the soft skills that I'm talking about. We have to identify what we want them to to do. If that's grid, if that's time management, if that's um, perseverance, if that's self advocacy, um, we have to be able to, to. I would say to show that right to show that this student has or has not learned that. And if that's important to us as a learning community, and that student's going, not going to move on until that's done. That has to run right alongside the with our hard skills, our core instruction um, in any content area. The, the redesign process too, it, it's, it's the structure of that, I guess the, the meetings, based on what we call the four disciplines of execution. And the very last one of those is the cadence of accountability. And it's that local level, that smaller group holding each other accountable through these weekly conversations. This is what I committed to, this is what I did. This is what my grade record looks like. These are the skills that my students have met and what they haven't, and this is what I'm gonna do about it. We're not quite there yet, but that is my, that's my vision, especially with a competency-based And I know we're short on time. You know, if you would answer the rest of those questions to me, I can make sure that the, the parent group receives your responses. Okay. So I know I know I posed a number of questions. So yes, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Can we expect a change with the retake policy? Can we expect a change with the retake policy? Um, yes, I think we can expect a change with the retake policy. I don't know what that will look like yet. <laughs> But I think for this process, we will see that there is going to be a change. I will say that those guiding principles of education that we, I believe, that great uh, philosophy was created on, that it's about the learning, right, and not the behavior, and not how fast I'm going to do this. That has to remain constant. But it's much different if I have a competency and I have proof and evidence multiple times that I've mastered this. That's what the student can move on. And it's not just a, a meaningless number in that entry. Jacob signs up. Joe Rich is on the deck. Again, thanks for the opportunity to be here tonight and have discussions. My topic's a little different, maybe not as direct, it's more in the subject matter area, um, but I think ties to a lot of the things with redesign, certainly why I want to bring it up tonight. Currently with one instructor, uh, Mr. Andy Morton is our A Vocational Education Program faculty member and supports a wide variety of freshmen through senior classes, but is currently limited to grow the program for the students. In addition, the FFA program he advises is at record numbers, around 70. Um, very active uh, between West Day earlier on Monday, a appreciation breakfast this morning, and a multitude of contests and career development uh, areas that he tries to provide all those opportunities for as a single um, faculty or teacher, faculty member. Um, the program currently supports pathways, and power, structural and technical systems, animal systems, plant systems, but the reality is advanced systems are not able to be part of the curriculum because it is a one-person program. Uh, Wamigo only has one instructor. It ranks in the minority of NCKL uh, schools that most have two teachers. Additionally, some NCKL and surrounding districts such as St. Mary's, Rock Creek, Rossville have middle school programs to start that 
uh, interest and education in those areas earlier on. Um, so really a couple of, my question is, is a couple, but one, the first one is, is thus, where does the Ag Vocational Education Program, where is it gonna be emphasized and, and prioritized as we look at the career pathway system and certainly the student interest that we have, there's 40 freshmen enrolled, we had to actually have two sections this year instead of the traditional one. Uh, we have a large group of students interested in an egg agricultural based uh, community and it's just not about farming. I, I see when we do career interviews, it's about farming and ranching. That's such a small, small percentage of the career opportunities that are out there and I think we can do our students a really good job of potentially expanding that and having these other opportunities. So I guess as we look forward, where is this potential program prioritized or look to potentially grow to support the community and student needs? That's a that's a good question. I know Mr. Moore met with us at the beginning of the year to talk about uh, his desire to add another um, ag teacher at the middle school um, and at the high school, or uh, one that could do both. I will say right now, Mr. Warren has pre-enrollment numbers at 37 in welding one, seven in welding two, 21 in animal science, 11 in horticulture, and 19 in animal science. And I know that things these are the pre-enrollment. I'm sorry, these are the brand moment for next year. Um, I know Andy wants another teacher right now, and I would love to give Andy another teacher right now, but I will say every single department would like another teacher to the nurse. Um, where does that fit ahead of any of the others? The numbers I have right here, it, it doesn't necessarily support that yet. Do I think that will change? I really do. I know this is a very, very strong ag community, and I think if that wasn't the middle school, that we, we would see significant changes there too. Um, the high school, because that is one of our gate teams or great gate uh, groups, um, we're looking at every single pathway, not, not just the ag, not just the health science, um, auto tech, um, sure. electrical. Yeah, I understand. It's, I understand there's a lot of, yeah. There, there's a lot. Um, we will keep working with Mr. Warren, and um, I, don't, I don't have a definite answer for that. Sure. But that's going to happen. But, yeah, that, and, that, and we've been fortunate that we're close to K-State. He often gets interns, our student teachers here that a lot of other schools don't. I think that while that's positive, we also use that as a crutch to help him teach the classes and whether that's, you know, it gives us those students great experience and being a faculty member at K-State, I appreciate those opportunities here. Probably the other thing I wanted, maybe, maybe it's more of a statement. I know there's a lot of discussion on MATC, Highland, and we are blessed to have potential opportunities there. I would highly, highly caution though, that we do not use that as a mechanism or a reason not to build our core and our, our teacher, our base here. Um, there's plenty of other instructors and if you talk to anybody students and transfer in, just because it's an advanced class doesn't mean it was worth the dog. There's a lot of junior college classes that kids come in, learn absolutely nothing, but they're getting out of basic classes at any advanced education location and they are, they're in trouble when they start getting into the mid-level classes because they didn't get the rigor. And I would make, I just want to make sure as we go this direction and utilize them, which I think is positive, and my own kids are going to use those. There's rigor in those classes, and we just don't say they're getting it there. That's going to be a huge, huge mistake, I think, for our education system and the students getting classes. Those partnerships we need to have, and we're blessed to have them. We need to make sure that they're the, the right education and they're getting out what they're what they're intended for and we don't use them as a crutch not to build our own infrastructure that's good very good thank you can can i add from your original the first part um mr Drushi? so at the middle level right now we, we are limited obviously and then mr cat addressed that but this year we um, this past Monday was our second round of career speakers. So um, one of our career speakers is Mr. Dugan, who is the person in charge of um, recruitment and those kind of things over at Can Equip um, with Ag Precision. Um, and so we've had him twice. Our third time will be um, not next Monday, but the Monday after. So to try to give that exposure, um, you know, our kids have, have the opportunity to sign up. We've had 
Dr. Pachta is one of our speakers, you know, law enforcement, um, Mr. Steele with electrical is coming in and talking. So we're trying to yeah, expose I and, yeah, and, and interest, and I, increase I, I that interest that in, so they hit that. Yeah, and I just don't want, I'll be honest, I just don't want that all to get lost in the shuffle of the, re okay. we're always looking at what's new and shiny, but where is, again, where can we build on our base? And this, this is a program I think has a lot of Absolutely. opportunity yeah. that we can continue to, to emphasize. So. A little passionate about this area. So. <laughs> Thank you, Joel. Thank you. Paul. And Bob. My name is Paul Schlifke. My wife, uh, Trish, and I have a daughter here at middle school. And I'll keep it short. I don't really have a question. I just wanted to compliment our staff at USD 320 on the way they've handled the COVID situation. Uh, it's kind of been a, a week by week thing at times. And just as, as more people learn what's going on and the health officials say, well, this is what we do now. I think the school has done a very good job and the staff's done a very good job of, of, uh, of going with the flow. So that's all I wanted to say. I saw open forum and, and uh, I want the opportunity to let the board know that as a parent, we do appreciate uh, what the USD 320 staff has done. And hopefully we're uh, seeing some live at the end of the time. Simple enough. <laughs> Thank you. Jim, how did that Oh, I'm sorry. I skipped Bob. Bob, and then Jim. Lose the mask, right? Great. Well, thank you, uh, uh, board members and administration, for the opportunity for uh, our group to come and, and be engaged. So I think one of the great things about our community is these kinds of opportunities um, to be uh, connected um, and to be able to have those clear lines of communications. Um, again, my name is Bob Weber, and uh, I'm joined my wife Tammy's here, and we're the parents of uh, what we think are three great kids. Have been really blessed to be engaged um, in the academic system here in Guamigo, and uh, again, appreciate the opportunity to come before you. Um, a couple of the areas uh, that I want to address um, really come along the block scheduling issues that we've talked about a lot, so I'll abbreviate those comments a, a fair bit. Um, but just to note that, uh, um, you know, I think from a, an academic perspective, and in my own experience working at, at K-State, and, and certainly uh, growing up and going through a school system that had uh, a more traditional class schedule, that that repeated exposure, um, particularly for the STEM and, and core curricular courses, um, is really, really important. And I think there's a, a number of opportunities where in, in block scheduling, we get distance and time um, that really affects our students to retain and implement the knowledge. And for block scheduling, um, being able to be prepared for that next um, section, um, having the discipline to do the review work um, is something that, well, frankly, many college students can't do, right? So it's a big challenge for our high school students um, to be able to do that. Um, I think one of the other things that's, that's really important, and I know we've had block scheduling for a period of time here in Long Beach, is really that um, uh, professional development of our faculty um, engaged in the system and team training on how to best implement uh, a block scheduling system. So I think there are some positives, and I'll talk about those in a minute, but really uh, managing those systems very closely so that we don't have, you know, I get repeated stories about, you know, call me out of class, but I don't have anything to do, I'm bored watching YouTube, all that kind of stuff, which as a parent and taxpayer kind of makes my head spin a little bit. So um, I think there's a really important class time. We have limited time with our students. Um, my wife and I talked the other day about you know, the number of spring breaks that we have left with our daughter, right? It about brings tears to your eyes. Um, but having that contact, um, there's only so many days, so many hours, and a lot of content to get through. Uh, making efficient use of that is, is really important. Um, opportunities. I think one of the, the ones that's, uh, and I'll sort of 
little tangential commentary on uh, Dr. Garushi's comments. Um, you know, there's there's some courses that really benefit from extended class period. So um, welding, some of the ag tech courses, um, some of the AP courses where you've got students that are more intellectually mature, they can handle um, uh, more advanced content for longer periods of time, or certainly those. Okay, um, and so there's there's opportunity I think for our system to really work through maybe systems where we put you know basic level or core courses in a system that. Um, is more traditional in terms of daily class content, and then put the advanced and elective courses in the afternoon or some kind of block scheduling that allows more flexibility for um, either extended contact or less regular contact may be essential. Okay, so I want to uh, make sure we get those uh, in place. Uh, I will echo uh, Dr. Grushi's comments um, relative to the importance of um, you know, the ag courses. Um, and I think ag courses, sometimes we view them strictly as vocational, um, but they're really extensions of an implementation and application of a lot of the STEM coursework that our students take, right? So um, we go into uh, the crop production or the animal production courses. Those all rely on basic understanding of biological processes, mathematics, uh, and so forth. They're essential for those courses, and so they really provide an opportunity to extend and apply what they've learned uh, in their core curriculum. And that's why I think uh, a lot of students really value those courses because they can see then the direct connection between something that they learned in you know, maybe an algebra class um, that they go, gosh, I'm never gonna use this in my entire life. They show up in that class and end up using it, right? So there's a lot of value to reinforcement of some of those uh, ideas. The last area I wanna speak to real quickly um, and my timer is telling me I'm about to run out of time, uh, is the importance of core curricula. Um, one of the things we observe in higher ed is the, the lack of strength of students coming into um, uh, K-State and other institutions without the mathematics and chemistry and science background that they need to succeed. Um, so I encourage us to do everything we can um, to make sure that we've got a lot of strength in those programs and opportunities for students to take advanced stuff. One of the things I noticed reviewing some of the test statistics from our district um, is that the number of students that are in the very upper level of uh, math and science um, quantification or uh, ability um, is actually less than the state average. So on average, we're not too bad, but average doesn't tell us about the distribution. And I think part of our challenge is making sure that the advanced students also have a lot of opportunity to continue to excel. And I think in some cases, we, uh, Mr. Caddy pointed out that there's that differential in learning ability. Well, if the advanced students don't have an opportunity to go and be challenged, they get bored and they sit around and twist off, right? So um, we've got to make sure we've got opportunities for those students to stay engaged uh, and work further ahead in the curriculum. Okay, thank you. Those are then all the requests to speak that were submitted. We did have a few people who did not be here, so that's everybody who was present. Um, we have some other questions we want to answer. While we're doing that, I, I want to—I guess I want to support Mr. Cat. You know, much of this that we're talking about, that we have concerns about, he inherited. Jared, I'm going to take over the screen. Block schedule was here before Mr. Kent got here. Great policy uh, here when I got here, but but I thank you. Uh, I did very noticeable hint. Well, as I was saying, many of the things he's inherited, he's got broad shoulders and he's taken on a lot of things. He's been here a year and a half, one of those years is COVID. Give him a chance. Okay? Give him a chance. Redesign is, is being done because we know we have to make a change. We know we can do things better. Um, 
on the screen, I realize it's probably kind of hard to see, so we'll make that a little bigger. These test scores everybody's referencing, that's not a high school problem. If we have a decline in test scores, that is a K-12 problem. So please, if you're going to get on top of it, if you're going to be upset with people, that is our problem, like I said earlier. These are our students. Um, much of what they learn happens before high school. We need to fix the system from kindergarten, early childhood, pre-K, on up. Okay. Um, last year's scores were, were embarrassing. Embarrassing. That is in the ACT scores. Many of you are referencing are from the class of 2020. Not a class of 2020 was a solid class. ACT scores were embarrassing, and we are very disappointed. But what I have on the screen here, and let me, I really debated whether I would share this or not. But I do want you to know that we, we I've, been, I've been tracking scores since I've been here. High school principal for six years. Math scores bug the heck out of me. We've done some things. We've done some things that made a difference. On the left column, those are math scores. Clear back to 1996. Um, they're not. They're nothing to be proud of. The red scores are when we when we met or exceeded the state and national averages. There's not very many red numbers in there. We've got to do better. Um, Nick Scott's on his way to you know help to be a big part of that. The scores on the right. Sorry, you can't see those my column headings. The scores on the right are composites. Okay? That top number, the 20, that was last year's graduating class's average. And that class took, took the test before Mr. Cat was here. Okay? So that's our problem. We messed up somewhere down the road. Okay? We didn't. Mr. Cat's not responsible for that year. He's doing what he can to help fix it. The four or five years old previous, I keep hearing, decline, decline, decline. And yes, that is a huge decline, an unacceptable decline. But five years prior to that, we were above or way above state average. We were below that, and then we kind of matched it a couple years, and then we've been, you know, 22.8, 23, 23.2. Like I said, I went back to 1996. Those types of numbers were unheard of in Walmart. Now, we've got a year that sunk, and we're going to fix it. One challenge we have, and you need to understand this if you don't know, ACT is always taken in the junior year. Some take it in, their, in the fall of their senior year, but they've got to get it taken so it can be submitted to colleges. We never see national and state reports until the fall after those kids have graduated. We're doing more now to try and just look at our kids' scores in a more timely manner. We've got to do that. We're going to try and do better, but uh, we didn't get last year's the class of 2020, graduated in May of 2020, took the test probably in 2019. We didn't get those scores until December of 2020. That's no excuse, none whatsoever. We've got to fix this year. We've got to fix, you know, hope we, uh, we don't have national state reports for the, my daughter's class, class of 2021 yet. But, uh, you know, we've, we've got to look at it as much as we can and see what comes out, continue to make changes. So again, I may be getting on a little bit of a soapbox, but this guy is working his tail off, and many of the complaints, block schedule, grading policy, ACT scores from last year, he's trying to fix. He wasn't here when they really occurred. So, questions regarding that? Yes, sir, Mr. Tyner. <laughs> I, I continue to hear a lot about the ATC, the high one, you know, for the advance on the AP. But we've got to continue to remember the other 70% of our students that need that extra math. They need that repetition, science, things like that. I, I know we're striving to push these kids above and beyond, but we've got to remember the ones that, that don't have the support that's here today. They don't have the funds to do these other things. So I, I would love to see how we can continue to help them. Because that's the direct effect of that. So 
what are we doing there? I mean, I, I mean we've got a, a well uh, held amazing people uh, of our school district, our community. You know, like I've told you a million times, what can we do to help you? And I think that's what we're here for. What can we do to help you all do your job more efficiently and effectively? But I think this is a start, okay? Uh, you, we have a great community. We have great support from our parents. We, uh, you know, so much of what you saw earlier on things that we've done well this year and in the past is a reflection of what this community does. Support. So Adam, you know, this, this, this type of dialogue is, is what we need. This type of challenge from you is what we need. And I would say your challenge needs to start in the classroom with the teacher, okay? They, they learn, I learned as a teacher, that when I hear from that parent firsthand, it means a difference. I need to be able to understand. You know, when I, when I went into, uh, after a few years of teaching and going into administration, I always try to put myself in your shoes because I'm also a parent. I've had two, um, there in, in, in about three and a half weeks, I'll have two students graduate from Almeo High School. And uh, am I happy with everything? No, but I have a son that's successfully employed, not living in my, in my basement and doing very well. My daughter, I think, is on that track, and that's because of so many things that occurred and our teaching staff at Wilmington High School. Do we have an issue? Do we have a challenge? I'm sorry, I'm not pointing at you as an issue. Um, do we have an issue? Do we have some issues? Yes, we do. And, and uh, we've got it. We've got to get down and dirty and try and solve it. Laura? Okay, by the time my kids are in my school, I have three daughters in my school right now, my son graduated. Um, I just want to say that it's, um, I would like more of that communication. Like as a parent, I tell my kids to solve their own problems. So they teach this to go to the teacher. And when they do that, they don't get met with very well. And I know Megan's met with you, Mr. Cat, and I would love you to be in the rooms more because they can't as a kid. I tell my kids to respect authority. And it's really hard, and I want, if you can be there, and you're hearing Megan talk about a certain teacher, and you can go check on it because she doesn't have the authority over that teacher. So all she does is call me and say, Mom, get me out of class. And I'm just saying, it's happening with all of my kids in different rooms, and I don't think our kids can go to the teacher necessarily. I don't feel like as a parent, I know what's going on, and I want my kids to be successful, and I want them, by the time they were close, I'm like, you need to solve your own problems. Because I want them to be, I'm raising adults, and I'm raising children. And so I just, that's what I'm really looking for from, I guess, our administration, and love Mrs. Flynn, uh, for the reason we came to Lomigo, and this whole thing. Um, but I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I would like to see more of involvement with staff um, over che checking, going into classrooms, making sure they're actually teaching or doing what they're saying. Understood. Let me let me interrupt for just a second, then please, if I may, because I need to extend. Madam President, I make a motion to extend the meeting to 30 minutes. Second. All in favor? Motion extended. Listen, we uh, we have some questions we still want to answer that were pre-submitted. So, and we and we'll follow up. We can backtrack. You get what? All of our staff should be able to provide them with a syllabus. So if you run the roadblocks there with them, then the next step is to talk to Mr. Cat. Also, we didn't hear the solutions from the parent committee, and I know that you do have some. 
as well. But there's a couple of things. And part of it is, as redesign takes shape, as the pathways take shape, uh, you know, we've talked about the internships. I think reaching out to the community for more internships would be really important. The next thing is um, the parent committee. Um, I think we need help in other areas on communication. I do think that the teachers should be expected to send syllabuses out at the beginning of each year or each semester, depending on what it is. And parents should be able to follow along. But here, this is the big thing. There's going to be a lot of changes, and there's going to be a lot of accountability of students, and you know how that's going to be met. It is not going to be met with the students going, bring it on. When they say, put your phones away, put your phone, I mean, half the parents will not care, and the teachers will be. If we say that you cannot no longer have your phones out in class, the teachers will be the ones having to police that. Do they have time to constantly tell them to do that? So my request is that when decisions are made uh, that are going to be tough and they're going to be tough for the kids to, to take, that the parents somehow rally around us and say we are in total support of everybody, you know, pulling up the bootstraps. So anyway, and I, I, don't, think, I don't think that's going to be an issue. I, well, yeah. if, 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 I, we love that. That's what we're going to well, everybody does need to stay professional, but see, the kids, the kids have to get this message, and you do have to realize that there are parents out there who will not care nearly as much as you do. And so, anyway, I guess that's you're asking what the, the what we need. That will be it. And I figure the high school as they go into redesign, get the community more involved, get the parents more involved. That will be an ask back. That's a two-way street. The teachers too. Because they're needing to be held accountable and they're going to squeak a bit as well. And we need to support the people when that starts happening. I don't mean to step out of here, but it, it, yes, we, we will support that. Thank you for saying that. And I honestly believe if we keep that bar raised high, our kids will meet it. If these constant decreases, oh, well, well, we got to look good, we got to look good. And we're not keeping that bar high. If anything, in athletics, whatever. We need to keep it high for it. Kids will need it. They will need it. Well, and that starts in the classroom with our educators. It, I mean, it definitely starts here. But, well, yes, everything starts at home. It, 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 everything starts at home. But at the same time, if our educators are not demanding perfection, Perfection is not, I mean, you're not going to get to that, but you have to demand it, and we have to do everything we can to get to that point. Um, you all, most of you know me, and you know that I am not the, I'm very quiet, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think we've become very relaxed. We've become very, it's very easy to pass the buck over here. It's very easy to blame this or to blame that. But I hope that you all, will not do that and you will hold the accountability, raise the accountability level and make us raise our accountability level and it's going to be hard, it's going to be difficult, but it has to happen. And, and I know you're not going to disagree with me. Listen, I appreciate this, I'm glad we can have this, but I, I do want the people that submitted questions, I would like to get through those and since they're not here, they can probably go pretty quick and then there's time to follow. Continue this discussion. If the board's okay, I would be fine with that. That's a good plan. Okay. Mr. Graber, I know you've been anxiously waiting to answer a question that uh, in regards to the middle school, so I'll let you have it. All right. So the uh, question that was brought to us um, concerns teachers leaving. Um, we've got a few teachers leaving, heard lots of teachers leaving um, this middle school. Um, you know, when you look at our numbers, we do, you know, I'm not going to hide it. I've got eight and a half. Um, you know, are there growth areas for me? Absolutely. You know, and I'll cover, um, you know, what, what we have in place. Um, but out of that eight and a half, you know, that half piece, what we gained was a full-time music teacher here. Um, and, and in high school got a full-time music teacher up there. Um, so we're able to gain. We lost a half, but we gained a full with that. Um, so out of the eight, I've got two retiring, um, long careers. 
They've done exceptionally well. Um, we want to wish them well. I've got two that are transferring um, to a different building um, for uh, a challenging opportunity, great opportunity for them. Um, so of the four I've got remaining, um, you know, it's, it's different opportunities. Um, one is kind of a sabbatical, um, you know, needed to take a year to kind of focus on, on things um, with home business um, and so forth. Um, I do meet with every one of them. Um, they come into my office. You know, I ask that they come in and we, we talk. Um, I hope they're honest with me when we sit down. Um, you know, so everything we're getting from that, um, I think we're okay. Um, and then we do, I know the district has in place, uh, exit interview process um, with it as well, where they fill out. We get an opportunity and, and that, those are those growth measures you know, for me um, to look at, hey, here's what I need to look at differently. Um, you know, there there has been a shift in philosophies and, and those kind of things um, since I did arrive here um, with that. Um, I think some of them have been good, and I think some that, you know, you talk about, we got to tweak each year, and, and we try and we do, and we keep moving. So hopefully that answers that question or there any questions you guys have with regards to that, with our numbers? How is the process of replacing those that are leaving the building? Um, knock on wood, uh, very well. Um, I, you know, I do have a math opening um, right now that we are um, in the process of, of filling. Um, but beyond that, um, at this point of those eight and a half, um, all the others are hired and we're um, excited for, um, you know, all of those that, you know, we wish those that are leaving the new adventures, we wish them well. We, we know they're going to be successful in whatever avenues they go to. Um, we're excited about those joining the team, joining the family. And the other nice thing about it, we're not just filling them with four bodies, right? We're, no. We have a pool of people that uh, Mr. Brigham or Mr. McIntosh are able to, you know, get the best. Yeah, we we've, we've been very fortunate. With the pool of candidates for each position has been great. Mr. Gray, did you we did you touch on exit interviews? Yeah, okay. They said the district does have an exit right. interview process. Yes, I review that. I'm sorry. You know, thanks, thanks for me to <laughs> to improve on and work with. Okay, thanks, Travis. Uh, question that was submitted: Personal plans of study courses. How is the full access to plans of study courses and certification different than what's available today? Um, you know, ever, the questions that were pre-submitted were done so anonymously we didn't ask for emails or names or anything like that. Just a question. And uh, this person, you know, I appreciate it because they asked this, and I think another one they read they read the strategic plan. This is straight from the strategic plan. And so uh, appreciate that, but uh, Kale addressed this a little bit, but we just need to continue, continue to further implement that individual plan of study. We need to make sure our staff is properly trained because we have a counseling staff right now too, and putting that all on their shoulders is a monumental challenge. So we need to do a better job of working with the rest of our staff to help with that. Um, we're, we are talking and discussing possible increase in our counseling support staff, um, whether that's a post-secondary specialist or a uh, career specialist or, or social emotional specialist, so we can free up more time for, for this type of thing. So that's that's in discussion, uh, especially with the potential of uh, the CARES COVID relief money. Um, the partnerships with, that we talked about quite a bit tonight, the Community College, College, UNTC, the internship program that Mr. Cat referenced, those are all things that are happening and um, uh, new and, and so forth. Um, and then limits in schedule. That's that's part of that redesign process and changing that schedule. Uh, I know a lot of you said, are we moving away from the block schedule? I think that's loud and clear that we have a desire to move away from the block schedule. And Mr. Katz said he agreed there's a need for a change. So it's gonna happen. We just wanna do a good job. 
I'm okay with trying something and, and then it doesn't work and try it again, but it'd be better if we could get as close to right the first time as possible. Um, so anyway, the limits on our schedule and, and allowing kids to, to uh, access the plan to study needs more flexibility. So will we treat a new role for next year's purpose? Will we see the plan study happening now? Like a new schedule? No, not a new schedule. So the plans of study are the pathways. They are the the, the, the FCCLA classes, the egg welding classes. Yeah, those are those are in there all. Unless I missed the answer. Um, yes, <clears throat> you will. The plan of study is a process and product, all right? So it, it is a process and it's not just a 9 through 12 process. Um, and that's one of the things that, that we heard from some community members. It seems to be a pre-K-12 process that we're tracking and we're, we're we're reflected on our learning and our interests and, and, and how we're growing as an individual. But it is also a product. So you will see that and tell us some of the experiences of some of the um, the matchmaker, the uh, interest inventory that the students are taking in order to get into what they think they may want to pursue. Next question, Joe. Yeah. Yep. Uh, the, the next question <laughs> is uh, ACT prep. Uh, what what are the exact additional ACT prep opportunities planned? And will these opportunities be uh, or include building gaps in foundational learning? Um, a couple of the things that, that we do or have done, um, we do offer one time per year usually, and this could be more than one, so we have an interest in it, that power, power prep class. Um, usually that's approximately 20 students. And uh, I would say that's, in my opinion, one of the most beneficial things that a student can take advantage of um, to prepare for that exam. We do have an uh, ACT prep course in Ingenuity. Um, one thing that was dropped is the method test prep. And honestly, that was dropped because uh, it just it wasn't being utilized by students or by um, teachers. But that's something maybe that the district can, can look at again. Um, I know the counseling department advertises some additional things. One of them is the Sylvan ACT prep courses. Uh, the counseling office has multiple years of ACT practice tests that students can, can get. Um, Mrs. Kugler is here tonight. She sends emails about ACT prep information. Um, we also do offer our free statewide ACT in February. Um, in classes, and I think this is one of the poor, this is one of the most important things in, in an area that I think we can grow in. Um, <clears throat> for example, when we part of our, our literacy uh, work through, through TASM and our curriculum adoption is coming up with these tier one interventions of, of teaching vocabulary today. So everybody in the building is going to be teaching vocabulary this way uh, to increase that <coughs> or um, uh, academic language. And I think we can look at that too with some test prep, right? Maybe that's a maybe that's bell work at the beginning of the class, but every single student, every single class is getting some exposure and some repetitive practice for some of these test taking techniques. Um, and the last thing is uh, it's, it's data talks. And I know Mr. Leonard talked about when we did get our ACT data. Uh, that was that was eye-opening. I will tell you that was a slap in the face to look at that. And more than anything else, I think we discovered a need to, we've got to do better here with our, with our schools. Can I say on that? I just want to do a lot of you for sharing that. I know that's probably, I mean, it's safe to share all the practice for our, especially if you inherit it. Um, so I just want to do a lot of that today, that's bold, and I think we need more of that. Because I said this in our group, we're a very competitive community. And so if we can see, if you show us the scoreboard, you're going to get a lot of people behind you. Um, that's some of you sports. I know that that's really passionate in my family, it's not everybody, but I would say that if we're a competitive community, give us a scoreboard, and it's terrible, I and mean, you're going to get us all behind you to try and help make it better. Um, so make that stuff visible, even if it's rough, and um, you know, you're going to get. A lot of action, I guess, is what I'm saying. Yes, it's tough because there's a lot of blame, right, that we all feel. But I think collectively, you've got a lot of people who want to help raise us. So, thank you. Always. Regarding the training assessment, so traditionally in the past, we always had a small assessment report. And 
We review all the assessments from the previous year. Uh, Mr. Michael Scott, he is going to be doing that on a more regular basis with the board, uh, and, and especially with regard to fast grades, our, our new assessment tool. We used to do maps, now we're doing using fast grades, which is a we feel very good about it. Uh, much better tool, um, and we'll be taking the better data and will be used more frequently and reported more regularly. Question on social emotional development. Uh, again, uh, an insightful question and straight from our strategic plan. What is different in the social emotional development action steps that will improve the success measurement being tracked from what is being done today? So what's what's new? Um, Habitudes is the high school program, and it's 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 been done. I think they are in their second year, but it's still relatively new, and we need to make it different making sure our staff is, is, is more prepared to use it to teach it. That is the program that Mr. Graber has now adopted as well. Uh, it's a three grade program at the middle school level. He started with sixth grade, and so that everybody gets the sixth grade one, uh, everyone's taking that, that first step. And then he'll add the next year, the following year, and the third year, the year after that. So, so that is a new program. Uh, Kagan training. We have done a little sprinkling of Kagan, Kagan training every year with, with our staff. We, we send who we can in the summer. Uh, usually it's a, what, two or three people from a building. Yeah, we have some coaches trained now. Uh, we are hosting a Kagan Institute this summer uh, where we're going to try and uh, get at least 25 of our staff members to take part in that and continue to do that. Uh, if you're not familiar with Kagan training, but it really just, it's, it's best instructional practice. It's uh, teaching more on soft skills and collaboration. It's just solid instruction. And uh, we, want to, we want to promote that more in our district. And Scott is working hard on that. Um, I reference FastBridge. FastBridge is the new assessment tool we're using this year. Primarily your reading, math, ELA assessments. Um, but it also has an additional assessment, which is, is the SABER and my SABER. That stands for Social Academic and emotional behavior risk screener that we never tested social emotional before. We haven't tested yet with this because we jumped in with math and reading and, and we will begin the safer portion of fast bridge next year. That gives us specific data on how students are doing socially, emotionally, in regards to themselves and their academics. And it also provides supports that we need to develop. But when we get those results and we see the deficiencies and the weaknesses, we have a support program that we can implement. So that will be coming soon. And finally, um, we're joining a health, school mental health initiative group. Uh, we're going to start with the training this summer. Um, it was actually something we may have started a, a year earlier, uh, but darn COVID. Uh, COVID uh, took, uh, we decided to knock some things off our plate initially with COVID. So but we are sending a mental health team to that training this summer and just continue to work and grow that partnership with Bonnie Mental Health. So that's uh, that's on the social emotional front. Any questions on, on that? And success measures. Okay. Yeah, we had a bit of question, um, and it was, what is, what is the post-secondary success rate that I know we, we talk about? What does that mean, and how does that mean? Um, and this is something that the state had developed to um, basically measure whether or not a student is successful after they graduate high school. Um, and there's four things they look at. The first one is whether the student earned an industry-recognized certification while in high school. Number two is the student earned a post-secondary cert certification. Three is a student earned a post-secondary degree. And number four, a student is enrolled in a post-secondary setting in both the first and the second year following high school graduation. So if a student falls into one of these four um, items, uh, the state defines them as 
post secondary successful. How do we gather that information? How do we gather it? At the other left? Um, the state has a national student clearinghouse, right? And they have 97% of all post secondary students in the country that report that data. Um, we keep track of our industry certifications. We do that at the local level. But as far as what students do when they go to a post secondary institution, that all goes into this national student clearinghouse. Say that more common. Something like that. Yes, something like that. No, not social security. What? What's up? We'll get off phone call for sure. Not social security. Yeah, three percent of the schools across the nation do not report that. Um, there's two things that I want to say. Number one, um, and this is something that we can measure locally, though it will not report on our state. Card. If a student earns a livable wage, which I believe the state defines as fifteen dollars an hour or more, uh, but didn't didn't earn any of these these, these four things, um, that student technically is not according to say post secondary successful, but we would say yes they are at a, at a local level. Number two, if a student goes into the military, that student would not be post secondary successful according to the state. But we would know that at a local level. So I, I know. I know um, <laughs> but the, the, the reason for that is the, the confidentiality issue with uh, reporting them for the military. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, we do. Um, but yeah, that's that's what that means. Um, there's another thing that, that's kind of interesting. And if you times that post-secondary success rate by the graduation rate, um, you get the effective rate, which I know is, is probably the ultimate goal of everybody. Those are the four things. And I know Mrs. Kugler and I and, and our, our core, core counseling um, department and um, two of our CTU and internship coordinators are trying to track that at a more local level we have all of this post-secondary success data in one document, Sunflower Data Database. And that's what we're about. Questions? Comments? Okay, uh, we had a question on social education. How does the district monitor the social teachings of the teachers in the district as a parent, I believe that's primarily my job, and I would appreciate the teachers to focus more on getting our corporate scores at least to average before pushing them their own social awareness. So, teachers are expected to, to provide a classroom environment where, where the curriculum is taught. Bottom line, okay? If, 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 they're, if, they're, if they're talking about political topics and the political environment has been so divided the last however many years, uh, and our teachers are human, and they, they're on one side or the other. Uh, when that does come up, they need to be unbiased. They need to present both sides. If uh, you know, if they're not a history teacher, in most cases, they probably just need to stay away from it. But bottom line is, they're asked to teach a curriculum that's board approved, and uh, and then be a, a role model for, for students and, and help students weigh both sides of an issue and make decisions on their own. Now, if you think something's happened where someone is, is expressing their views and trying to put, force them onto a student, that's an administrative duty to take care of it. And you just need to, you, I, like I said earlier, always oh, start with the teacher. I think it's fair. Sometimes, sometimes uh, my kid comes home and, and the story they give me just by their body gesture or they're just by adding a few words here and there isn't all true. But I know my daughter's not a liar. But it's her perception. And so I think it's always fair to hear the other perception as well. But bottom line is our teachers are here to teach the curriculum, do their best job to provide students with the ability to, to think through things, problem solve, and make their own decisions, not present their views and opinions. Tim, do you think there's any level of recognition for a political bias? Uh, in terms of a district discipline discipline action. Super local, like in the classroom. In the in the do you think that some of that's going 
Do I think it's going on? Well, uh, yes, I think it happens because, like I said, people are human. I mean, you probably have employees, Aaron. Retribution. Retribution. Ret I'm saying retribution. Always. You're saying do they take things out on their students? And their parents. Do you think that happens anymore? Well, I certainly hope not. Like I said, it's not. We we don't live in a perfect world, and none of us in here are, are definitely not perfect. If that happens, we need to fix it. I agree. You know, we uh, when we when we when I worked as a principal for many years, students felt like someone was picking on them. You know, obviously we, we look into it, we investigate, and we follow up with with the other students, and we always made it very very clear. Any further retribution, any further bullying, any further whatever you're doing to this other student, you know, if, if it happened again, of course, if consequences were applied, you apply consequences. And of course, you know, we had to make it very clear that that didn't happen. I'll tell you why I asked that question to you. A lot of the parents are afraid to say anything. There's a lot of people that aren't here today because they very much believe in that. And it's kind of scary to stand out and say some things, so I want to congratulate everybody for saying things because we're all here to work together. But there is a super big fear around this community that there is retribution for those that are not. Well, all I can say is you've got to have the courage to come forward and and give 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 uh, give everybody the opportunity to express their I what we're trying to do here, but I, I'm, I'm asking you. Overtly, because I think it's in everyone's mind. And I've had people in this room was for that. And it's crossed our mind. And one thing I guess, feel me, I'm probably usually a sacrificial lamb. I'll say things that I should. So I'm saying it because I think that's one of the things we've got to fix if we're going to move forward. I mean, in earnest fix, for real fix. Everybody's got to lay down their guns because we all, we got to talk about it. Yeah, you know, I can say I, I, I feel like I, I know our staff very well and I feel like. Uh, very, very high majority of our staff are professional, responsible. Their kids, the students, if they have their best students' uh, interest in heart and in mind. Do we have some that, that uh, make mistakes? And in any organization, we have some that don't do a good job of that. And the, and we need to work on it. Basically. But I, I think, like I said, I, I want to support. We have we have lots of teachers, great teachers. Laura? Uh, so are we supposed to email or call or what would be the best way to talk to a teacher if we feel that it is necessary and something that needs to go on? What is the best way? Uh, well, I think email seems to be the easiest way because we know teachers have schedules where they only have plans certain times a day. So I, I my recommendation, and of course when I surveyed all of you this last year, your preferred <laughs> communication always is email. I start with an email and I ask for a point. Ask for an appointment to call or ask for an appointment to visit. Uh, you know, sometimes things can be handled with email, but you know, the best advice I can give you if an email, if it's a sensitive subject, email is just to set it up and share the information. It's not or share, make the request. Sharing it on email is just rarely works out as well as it could or should have. Hey, Tim, I'm going to interrupt you. Just because um, we got a few questions left, and uh, everybody being here, we, we, we should finish. Uh, this all didn't actually come about in the last six months. This has been growing for years, so I'm glad you're all here. So, Madam President, I make a motion to extend the meeting 30 minutes. Okay. All right. Corey, motion, Rocks, seconded. All in favor? Thank you. And I will say real quick, just to the newbies and to the people that don't follow us religiously, I know you, you do, but um, board meetings have to be, this is our last extension, we can't do another one. So let's, let's, all, let's all make good use of this time. So what we've got is uh, about two or three more questions and we'll get through those and then we're here. We'll be here. We'll ask our admins to stay here. So if you got questions, we'll, we'll go to that time. I think you guys deserve it. It's my, it's my thought, my opinion to that. Jared, if you allow me to take over the screen again. Um, our next question, I'm going to put something up because it's, it's a question I had uh, to survey area districts, uh, and it's regarding PLC and plan time. So the question is, how much PLC and plan time 
do other NCKL schools and area schools have? The outside perspective is that Wamigo spends less time in instruction time compared to other schools. Also, can off time be better aligned among different schools within USD 320 as being aligned previous to past year? So, share my screen. Okay. Um, hopefully you can see that. Uh, but this this is regarding contract days and instructional time. It's not all the, the nitty gritty specifics, but it's top level numbers. Uh, how many contract days we have, how many student days we have, then elementary plan time, middle school, high school plan time. And I, I was able to get this information in the last couple days from from Wamigo, Rock Creek, Chapman, Cobb Valley, which is St. Mary's Rossville, uh, Alma Wabunsi, Place Center, Concordia, and Abilene. Uh, you can see there our contract days is 185. We have uh, student days of 173, and that depends on which building uh, you're in, you know, the parent-teacher conferences and so forth. Um, Elementary plan time. This is a negotiated agreement of 200 minutes per week, but Amy and Carrie will tell you that they, they, most teachers get more than that, but that's our negotiated agreement. We have to provide 200 minutes per week. Another detail that's not in there is, is you might look at this and say, well, geez, they only get that, but the high school gets this uh, bigger chunk of time. Uh, elementaries also have teaming time, okay? Grade level teaming time, et cetera. Well, we just added that with early release this year. So they lost that time. It was in the contract day. So they have considerably less than the high school. Let's just. Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm sorry. I agree with you. I agree. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a high school teacher. Yeah. 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 Um, and then middle school is 45 minutes a block. They get a block a day. They also have some team time. I can't remember, Travis, so once a week or is it? Yeah. Yeah, PLC once a week. time and then grade level meeting. Grade level time yeah. as well. Yeah. Which is where some plan time occurs. But, but uh, and high school gets they get that, that block. We're on the block schedule. They get it every day. Um, if we go away from that, this is obvious that will obviously go away. Um, negotiated agreement, I believe for secondary is is minimum or for high school is a minimum of 50 minutes per day. Marysville, uh, all the way across to Abilene, you can see ranges from, from uh, 188 and a half, I think, to the high at Rock Creek to 181 at the low at Alma Walt Butsey. And we kind of fall in the middle in terms of contract days and, and student days. Um, plan time is, is, is pretty similar across the board. You know, there's, there's more detail you can dig into as well because one of the superintendents emailed me today and asked, well, how many instructional minutes does everyone actually have per day? And we're going to probably add that to this chart as well. It's good, it's good information to have. But that was a specific question. Um, and then there's a second part to the question, was the off time be better aligned among different schools? We are going to continue to look at that. And I, I, I'm assuming they're referencing our late start on Wednesdays at the high school, early release on Fridays at the other three buildings. Um, we actually talked about that, and we're gonna we're, we are gonna bring it back up. Okay, so more to come. Okay. There's a perception that that may be one of the headwinds for why teachers don't see a more moving away from box schedule. If you're going to lose possibly 40 minutes of plan time. When we talk about supporting each other, that's where we may get headwinds from teachers in some of these changes. And we also need support as parents recognizing that 
there, there's going to give, be some giving on every direction of us, students, parents, teachers, administrators, with these changes. That's very, very fair, very true. And I, I, as a teacher, if I had an option to choose between getting 50 minutes plan and 95 minutes plan, you know, in my part where I first want to, want to, uh, I don't know if hard is the right word, but, but yeah, I could better do my job with a little more time, but you're right. Students first, and if schedule change is best for our students, then yeah, 95 minutes of plan time is probably not going to be uh, in the in the cards. But so, we're, we're, I, I want to see kind of follow up to that because that's where we like, understood the history of our teachers not wanting to make change with our schedule. And with teachers, it's not like they're not going to be able to change their lead and how those changes might be implemented, or at least the focus so far. That's really why I asked the question if we could have a parent site committee added to tag along with the redesign so that we can ensure the focus stays collectively from teachers and parents on the CPPs. So just want to follow up with that. And, and Trey, just to follow up too, I think um, you should know that you're right. It's a big part of a redesign process is making sure your teachers are on, are on board. But they're not they're not driving completely driving the ship without some oversight but to make that happen those teachers have to have confidence in a leader if they want to jump into the redesign process they have to have confidence in the person that's at the top and that's why they chose to do this last spring because they they heard mr cat's views they, they listened to what he had to say they listened and said you know when we went into COVID. We've got to come out of COVID and make some changes. We're an opportunity to make some changes that will improve education. And he got his staff behind him on that. So, so I think. You know, everybody's well intended. It's yeah. just there's, you know, natural tendencies, like you say, it's just say, hey, I've got 50 minutes. Yeah, we're all human. Yeah. yeah. If we got to have confidence in our teachers, just like, you know, he needs confidence in his educator, his staff. We have that confidence in them. They're going to get it done. And that's what I'm doing. Okay, so that's the plan time question. And the last submitted question we have is uh, part of our strategic plan is, is increasing student involvement. We all know that our students that are involved in activities, whether it's athletic or, or other uh, uh, extracurricular and co-curricular activities, if they're involved, they're better students. It's, it's, a, it's a proven statistical fact. Um, so, question: Increased involvement in all co-curricular and extracurricular activities. How exactly is this proposal expected to be realized under current constraints of resources? Will more coaches be hired? Will more uniforms be ordered? Even if the sport is not up for the six-year uniform cycle, so that all team members feel like a member of the team. Will additional equipment be ordered? So, too, so all team members are safe. Will additional facilities be built? Um, all I can say is, is yes. Yes, if we had a golf five or six years ago, we had a great partnership with a with a group here, not just golf, girls golf. We had a girls golf. And uh, kind of got the program off and running, and now the, you know, we are fully supporting a, a, a very successful girls' golf program. Um, when we've had excess numbers, um, Mr. McIntosh is in here, but we've had that in the, in the middle school. We, we we do our best to order jerseys. Sometimes a jersey that's four years old and the replacement isn't perfect. That's a battle in any any school, but but we're going to do our very best to provide the uniform provide the equipment uh, uh, on the May agenda is a proposal to make sure we have enough baseball softball coaches next spring when our numbers get to a certain point for safety reasons for supervision reasons for better instruction uh, in, in that activity those things will all we're going to take care of our kids so so if it requires more uniforms if that's the biggest problem we have to deal with we can handle it yes what about what about those other areas, or the ad programs, or the arts, art programs? What about those kids? And apps, they're right there on the same level. Um, we're adding a fine arts teacher at the middle school this year.
to better meet the needs of, of, of that enormous group of, of singers and, and fine arts program. We know we know Walmingo is very, very proud of their, their fine arts and it's very near and dear to many hearts. And the CTE, the, the, the FBLAs, the FCCLAs, the FFAs, all of those things we, we will try and uh, meet the needs of our students. Okay, that's all the question, but uh, uh, as Corey stated, if, there, if, if we wanted to, if we had time at the end to open up to more dialogue, um, and, and we didn't exactly follow the protocol we, we expected, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. We just wanted, we set those things in place to make sure that we get through everything instead of we getting through, instead of getting to seven questions and we have 21 to get to. So, so we appreciate your patience with that. We appreciate your participation. Now, I guess, Claudia, just open it up to. Yeah, I mean, we've got, what, we officially have 19 minutes left before we have to officially end, so. Amy? Hi, I'm not sorry about that, so I apologize. Um, first of all, you know, I do want to thank you for the opportunity to meet tonight. Um, we did not come here with the intent to criticize you or Mr. Platt or anybody. We have been in this community for a long time, and I think all the parents here know how much time everybody's putting into making this a great place for our children to live. Um, I do feel bad because I do think these parents here are giving a bad rap other people um, and that's not our intention our intention was never to come together as a negative group we know that change is needed and we support those that are working so hard especially these educators who are trained in education and know what our children need and so we support them wholeheartedly but as i said earlier you know we care for our kids and, and again these parents have been the ones who have supported our kids through every building in this community we have supported our kids through Central, West, Middle School, and High School, and we will continue to support these teachers and give them what they need. But I'm not going to apologize for advocating for change because this has been going on for a long time. And I think that's just why we're here. We all want what's best for our kids and our teachers. And so I just want to clarify, we did not come here to point fingers at anybody, but just to collectively, you know, talk about how to best move forward. Um, so my questions are this. I know that in regards to pathways, you know, you want to get together with the, the students, the teachers, and the parents. But as a parent, you know, my kids have enrolled in classes, but I haven't seen what the options are. Um, I know I emailed you and you said that you would share that with me once it was ready. But I do have, you know, some meetings coming up. Can we at least um, have what our, our kids have to choose from so that when we go in to meet with these teachers, we can kind of have an idea of what options are so that maybe I can talk to my kids at home about their pathway options and then that way we're more prepared for the meeting. Um, and then my second question is just in regards to um, the grading policy. I know I've spoken to you last year about this, but with, you know, every teacher has um, the right to make their own choice on when a teacher kid can and cannot be taken to test. How are the grades being if one math teacher allows a test to be taken, but another math teacher doesn't, how are these being handled? Um, and how are how is the GPA from one student to another? Not that I'm comparing students, but I'm just saying, I think we need some uniformity in, in the GPA. And that's my other concern with the grading policy. Not that it has to be in our responsibility. What was the Yes, okay, so no. the, the course catalog, I believe we updated that now. That is online. Um, I can use it with the and see what we have to offer. It is um, online? It's it is on online. the high school website? Because last week you said it wasn't available. The master schedule was not available. But now it is? It will be very soon. <laughs> <laughs>
ask questions in a way where um, many people on our community met with you, met with you, and I don't feel like we got anywhere with the conversation, hearing a lot of this. If we could do this, um, we'd like to do this. We heard that a lot tonight. Um, you know, we want bold, confident statements from our administration. I understand that. We are going to have a lot of this for the whole reason process. I'll be the first one to tell you that. We don't know what it's going to look like when we're not. And it will change. They have a lot. that uh, 
Because um, my mom was a teacher, and my mom made a statement to me once that said, one of the hardest things about being a teacher is that everybody thinks they know your job. It would be really challenging for, I'm sure, people to come into my workplace and tell me problems with them point that direction. So I appreciate you being receptive, because we all care, and that's why we're here. Um, I have three kids in the school system with my husband. Uh, Ty is a third grader. I have identical twin girls who are first graders. We have had fantastic teachers, and we have had phenomenal teachers within the Central and West School District. 
I think a lot of the things that I'm hearing tonight, and I've had the same concerns from friends that have high schoolers um, and, and different systemic problems that I'm concerned about. We chose to open enroll in the Wamego School District. We technically don't even live in the district. And we open enroll here because of some of the state scores, because of some of the, I mean, to be honest, I'm, I'm an education snob. I teach at K-State. I teach 500 students every year. I have 75 advisees that I help shape through the program. I receive them as high school graduates and hopefully prepare them for a world out there. And I think Juanigo does a pretty good job, but I agree, there are some things that we can do to better improve. My question, or, or really my main, my main point that I'm hearing tonight, is I think I'm hearing symptoms of the same problem. I'm not entirely sure that block scheduling is the problem. I'm a scientist, and so I looked at the data. I evaluated a bunch of research papers on curriculum design. I'm sure you all have too, right? The data is pretty mixed on block scheduling. There's not a great, there's, there's advantages, there's disadvantages, there's not, a, there's not a very clear way one is better than the other. The same thing is true with the test free take policy. The main symptom of these though, I, I, I think that these are all symptoms of a larger problem in terms of accountability just collectively throughout the system. But I want to say that that is problematic for both our maybe problematic teachers, but also our best teachers because I want our best teachers to stay in the school system, and I worry about us collectively coming across as being anti-teacher. And that's one of my greatest fears, is that we would be an anti-teacher district. And I think that we have some phenomenal teachers, and it's important for us to support our teachers, it's important for us to learn how to, and as parents, and, and community supporters, to help figure out how can we better train young teachers. I believe in curriculum. I believe in foundational programs. We need to hold everybody accountable. And that goes to our best teachers, but it also will keep our um, <clears throat> teachers that aren't as strong further along in the system as well. And so I think all of these are, are symptoms of kind of that same general problem. Um, I think you're hearing tonight, we volunteer to help. I volunteer to help, let us know what we can do to help, but please let our teachers know, as well as our administrators, that we do care and that we don't want to come across as anti Wamigo because we are one Wamigo. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. It's great to have you. Thank you all.